Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brad Sears, and I'm Executive Director of the Williams Institute. And welcome to our 16th annual uh, update on sexual orientation in gender identity law and public policy. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here, uh, and we're thrilled you're joining us for the first time uh, in this great uh, new space, uh, uh, the Luskin Center, the first time we've had the conference here. Uh, one thing I'm approving already is the air conditioning uh, <laughs> compared to the law school. So we hope uh, you have a great and comfortable time here. We're starting a little bit late, so uh, I'm not going to do much of an introduction. Uh, but I would like a group of people to uh, stand up who are members of our Founders Council at the Williams Institute. Um, and it's really because of their kind of generosity uh, and their talents and skills and volunteering their time that makes all of this happen. So if you're Chuck Williams, uh, our members of the Founders Council, can you stand up and let's give a round of applause for our Founders Council. Obviously, when we met a year ago, uh, we were anticipating a much different year uh, than the one we had uh, in terms of LGBT rights. Um, and exciting things keep happening that impact uh, the rights of LGBT people, uh, including today. So to lead off uh, our conference uh, is our first panel on LGBT rights and the Trump administration. Um, I'm not going to introduce that moderator uh, for very long because you'll find her background as well as the background of the rest of our moderators and speakers uh, in this packet. And if you didn't grab one on your way in, you can get one at the first break. Um, but I'm delighted that this uh, first panel is led by someone who has been a leader for a number of years in think about uh, LGBT rights, our visiting scholar this year, Nancy Polikoff. Uh, thank you, Brad, and thank you, uh, everybody. This, of course, it would be impossible to have the Williams Annual Update in 2017 without talking about LGBT rights and the Trump administration, because it is the reality of our lives right now, and the people we have with us are people who make it their full-time job to think about how LGBT rights can not just continue to exist but prosper. Um, no matter what the circumstances are in Washington or anywhere else in the country. So we're uh, fortunate to have these four speakers with us today. They do have extensive bios in the program, so I'm not going to go over all of that, but I just invite you very much to look at them so that you can truly appreciate the level of expertise on this panel. We are going to um, begin with Shannon Minter, who is the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, who very soon will have been a lawyer with the National Center for Lesbian Rights for 25 years, um, and so has spent an entire lifetime committed to the issues we're talking about today. Um, our next speaker will be Melissa Goodman. Melissa is director of the LGBTQ Gender and Reproductive Justice Project at the ACLU of Southern California. Um, before that, um, she uh, had a distinguished career at the New York Civil Liberties Union and did the organization's LGBT and reproductive rights work there. Following Melissa, we have Meet Sony, who is the directing attorney of the Immigrant Defendants Law Immigrant Defenders Law Center, which goes by IMDEF, but I did ask her what the full name of it was, so I could tell that to you. Uh, she's the directing attorney of their adult representation project. She spent seven years before that at the Public Law Center in Santa Ana, and before that was a People Justice Fellow. And finally, we have Rick Zaber, who is the executive director of Equality California with a very long history of advocacy in California for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues uh, during his time in private practice and since. And so without further ado, uh, we are going, each of them is going to speak for um, roughly 10 minutes or so, and that is going to give us enough time for discussion among them and questions from you guys. 
Yeah. Yo, well, thanks so much, Nancy, and uh, thanks for having me here. This is a beautiful space, and I really want to thank all of you who support the Williams Institute. It plays an incredibly important role in our movement. Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit about what's going on in the Trump administration with rollbacks in education and employment, and then how those rollbacks are interacting with or in some instances affecting our litigation strategies, specifically around trying to win protections for both gay, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people under federal sex discrimination laws. It's become a very kind of three-dimensional uh, chessboard here in trying to, to navigate this new territory. So, you know, broadly speaking, our movement is trying to achieve comprehensive national anti-discrimination protections for all LGBT people, trying to pass new state laws, of course, trying to pass a comprehensive federal law that would cover employment, housing, public accommodations, education, really would be really comprehensive. And there was such a, a bill introduced last year, the Equality Act. But because of the current composition of so many state legislatures, they're very dominated by conservatives right now, and the current composition of Congress and our president, you know, it, it's, it's making legislative progress, either at the state or federal level, has become a very grueling and challenging process. Uh, it's important to keep, the, keep trying, and uh, I'm still hoping we might get more states this year, but it's, it's definitely challenging. But on a much more positive note, we've been making just some incredible progress in the federal courts, and it's really quite honest. In about the past 10 years, we've had a number of federal courts of appeal, the 1st Circuit, the 4th Circuit, the 6th, 9th, and 11th Circuit, all of those, that 5 out of 12 of the federal courts of appeal have actually, so almost half, have actually held that federal sex discrimination laws do protect transgender people. And I'll just note that the Williams Institute data and research has played a very important role in those victories. The thing was probably filed amicus briefs in every single one of those cases. And that's primarily in the Title VII employment context and Title IX education context. So in the education arena, there has been so much activity this past year. It's been like an incredible roller coaster. Because we have the wonderful developments under President Obama's administration where the U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Justice put out this amazing guidance that sort of tracked all these emerging positive uh, cases from the federal courts and they told schools all over the country that you have to treat transgender students equally and across the board in all respects, athletics, uh, accommodations, and, and restrooms, of course. But then um, that was, as I'm sure you all remember, made a pretty big splash and uh, they generated some pretty serious uh, backlash. The Texas and a number of other states filed a lawsuit in Wichita Falls, Texas, challenging the guidance and looking for asking the court to issue an order stopping the federal government from enforcing that non-discrimination policy. If you wonder why the heck they filed that in Wichita Falls, uh, which is a very you know, obscure part of Texas, my home state. There's no reason at all for anyone to ever go to Wichita Falls, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> it's just no ground. <laughs> I had a cousin there when I was growing up, and I remember thinking, I've got to get out of this state. <laughs> um, but uh, that's because the Wichita Falls, there's only one federal district judge, so when you file there, you know exactly who you're going to get, and he's one of the most reactionary judges in the whole country. He loves nothing more than striking down uh, Obama uh, administration regulations. He struck down a number of those. So they got what they wanted and they got this judge, Reed O'Connor is his name, to say, no, no, this guidance is all wrong and the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, you, you cannot enforce it. And then there was a similar case filed by some other states in Nebraska that just ne there was never any action in that case. Uh, so in the meanwhile, so that's going on. In the meanwhile, there's the Gavin case that I know you all have heard about, about the transgender student, transgender boy from Virginia who was initially allowed to use the boys' restroom and then some parents made trouble and got the district to change their policy so the guy had to go to court to try to get back to where he had been with being treated the same as other boys. 
and that case went up to the Fourth Circuit, which supported Gavin, but they relied on the Department of Education guidance from the Obama administration. And then that decision went up, was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. The school district asked the U.S. Supreme Court to take it, and they did. And so, you know, there was briefing, and there was just like a huge outpouring of amicus brief support for Gavin. Again, Williams Institute filed a great brief. But then uh, President Trump got elected, the Department of Education withdrew that guidance, and then the Supreme Court kind of took away the basis of the decision they were reviewing, so they sent back to the Fourth Circuit. So that's, Gavin's case is now back in front of the Fourth Circuit, and they're supposed to decide without, there's no guidance anymore, because that's got, that has now been yanked under uh, President Trump. They're supposed to decide whether that the law itself, the statute itself, Title IX, protects Gavin. So we have a bunch of other cases on that same issue kind of also percolating up there. Uh, there's one in the Seventh Circuit that just got argued before a very um, receptive panel in the Seventh Circuit on behalf of a, another transgender boy named Ash Whitaker who was being denied uh, use of the correct restroom. And then there's another case already pending in the Sixth Circuit it happens to be an NCLR case on behalf of a very sweet little seven-year-old transgender girl who was being really badly treated by her school and the one below and there's an injunction that's requiring the school to treat her to respect her being a girl and she's doing so well right now but the school's appealed so that's in front of the Sixth Circuit. So we've got three cases on this issue of transgender students in restrooms in front of three different courts of appeal which is a pretty, pretty big deal. And one of those cases may very well end up going back up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I should just mention um, the the singer that President Trump uh, used at his uh, singer used at his inauguration, uh, Jackie Avancho. Her sister is a transgender girl, and uh, she also has a case in Pennsylvania that she won. The her school is not letting her use the right restroom, and uh, she brought a case and, and she won that. All right, I'm gonna. Jump over real quick and just briefly uh, talk about what's going on in the employment arena around uh, gay people and employment issues. So the good news is that President Trump did not roll back the existing executive orders, presidential executive orders that protect federal employees from discrimination based on both sexual orientation and gender identity. And he also did not roll back the uh, executive order that uh, President Obama had issued that requires the federal government only to do business with companies that don't discriminate against LGBT people. He did kind of gut the enforcement mechanism recently, which was not great, but the executive order itself still exists. And uh, just I'm going to conclude here by just noting that we are start the same way we have made all this amazing progress with transgender people in the federal courts under sex discrimination laws. Well, we're starting to see that happen around sexual orientation and gay, lesbian, gay, and bisexual plaintiffs now. We finally have the breakthrough that we've all been waiting for for so long with the Seventh Circuit uh, just very recently, um, days ago, issued this amazing decision saying that Title VII fully protects lesbian, gay, and bisexual employers, employees in the workplace. The Title VII prohibits sexual orientation discrimination, which the court held is a type of sex discrimination. So that is a really big uh, achievement. And there's two other circuits now that are looking at, or we hope we're soon looking at that issue too, the 11th Circuit and the 2nd Circuit, where um, uh, one is a gay male plaintiff, one is a, a lesbian plaintiff. Both of them were discriminated against on the job. They actually, we actually have negative panel decisions from both of those circuits, but the panels in both cases, I don't want to make this complicated, but the panels in both cases basically said we'd really like to rule in favor of these plaintiffs and we, we think that sex discrimination does include sexual orientation discrimination. So there's old, older precedent from the circuit on the books and we're just a little panel and we can't change the precedent. So they both, in both cases, at least one of the judges on the panel said we really think the entire court should revisit this issue. And there's petitions pending in both of those cases, asking both the entire 11th Circuit and the entire, not the 11th, did you tell me? That's, and we, it, you're right, the, the, I was just thinking when I said that, I don't think they've filed yet in the second, but I think they're going to. Yeah, yeah, going to. 
Um, so there soon will be in both, in both cases. The request to ask the entire court to revisit this issue. And if we get enough positive decisions or two more positive decisions on that, we are folks well on our way to having a nationwide ruling that existing federal law fully protects LGBT workers in the workplace. Now that doesn't give us the whole comprehensive public accommodations, housing credit, et cetera, but it sure would be a huge step forward. So um, I am, I'm going to stop there, except to just end on the uh, a rather obvious point, but an important one. Bill Gorsuch got confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court today. There's, we have no reason to believe that he's going to be at all sympathetic or friendly to us on any of these issues. And it really underscores the extreme importance of us all continuing to be very vigilant about judicial appointments and, you know, the reality is that President Trump gets one more appointment on the court to replace as one of the more uh, progressive, supportive justices. All of this will, will like, be taken away. So it's really important that we all stay very engaged on that issue. Um, good afternoon. So that was me projecting. I forgot to hit a mic on. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction um, and talk a little bit about the work, um, in particular the ACLU, but other organizations as well, is doing to kind of combat the threat of a sort of vast expansion of the use of religious exemptions uh, to permit discrimination. Um, and this is coming up, you know, both with respect to denials of healthcare services and um, with respect to LGBT discrimination. And I'll talk a little bit about some things happening in the reproductive justice space, only because the law that's being developed there, too, is going to be quite relevant um, for what's, what's going to happen when we may or may not have laws that come down the books that are trying to expand people's ability to use religion to discriminate against LGBTQ people. Um, the first thing you know, that we saw coming out of the, the Trump administration that you might need news reports about um, was about, this is about a month, two months ago now, that there was actually a leak. Um, version of an executive order has not been issued yet, um, but it was an executive order that, you know, essentially would have given very radical new powers uh, to federal employees, to federal contractors, to federal grantees, to basically discriminate with, with federal money, uh, to impose their religious beliefs about a whole set of things, specifically uh, their views about marriage, um, their views about transgender people, if they had a view that, you know, you know, gender could only mean your sex assigned at birth. Um, their views about whether premarital sex is bad and the role of sort of women in the world in the workplace. Um, you know, all those sets of um, and, and I'm sorry, also obviously views on, on abortion and conception. Um, basically, it would have purported to allow people to impose those views even in the course of doing their federal jobs um, and actually um, using federal money when um, doing federal programs uh, through through grants. We um, I should also say that it also um, allowed employers uh, to deny employees um, health coverage for contraception and abortion, actually taking the Supreme Court's decision in Hobby Lobby and sort of vastly uh, expanding it to basically all employers. That, um, it turned out, it leaked, and there was a lot of, you know, news reports about, you know, why it was scuttled. But, you know, frankly, we, we um, are not resting easy, and we think that it is likely to come back and to come back in some form and and um, you know we will be we amongst many other organizations I think will be ready you know to tackle it um, and to, to take it on when it comes but I think it's a sign of where the Trump administration wants to go where the Trump administration probably feels uh, they have something that they owe to um, to folks that have been pushing for this for a really long time so so that that's the main thing we've seen on that front at the federal level um, but there is, I think it's worth talking about a number of things that are happening in the states because you know, what's happening at the federal level obviously is also emboldening um, states to do to do a lot of mischief. And um, I guess I'll just talk, I'll kind of jump around, I'll talk a little bit about the states. Um, actually, let me say one other thing about the federal uh, picture. You probably heard a bill introduced last year in last year's Congress um, called the First Amendment Defense Act. Um, this is not, it's actually not been reintroduced yet this year, but Trump actually pledged to sign it, um, if it if it passes. It's a bill that would basically prohibit the federal government from taking any negative action, like any negative action, against a business or a person that discriminates against LGBTQ people um, based on their beliefs about, about marriage. 
and and basically their view that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. They would like to implement that view. It basically would support to tie the hands of the federal government to enforce non-discrimination law about that. Um, this obviously would be a terrible thing, um, and it would basically mean that you couldn't have non-discrimination enforcement. You couldn't have them impose any kind of tax penalties on an institution that you know say they have tax exempt status and was trying to do that. Um, you couldn't yank away federal money that they might be getting. Um, it would, and you wouldn't be able to take away people's licenses. It would be a problem. We haven't seen it come back yet, but um, we have seen it um, pop up in the state. Versions of it popping up in state legislatures and being introduced there um, to allow people who use state money, basically, to do these things. And we've actually seen that in, in six states. Um, last year, a bill like that actually passed in Mississippi, and it's been challenged, and it's actually up before the, before the Fifth Circuit. Uh, they won uh, in, in the trial court, so we'll see what happens with that. We're also seeing in the state legislatures a, um, a rash of, of bills, I guess there's five right now, that are basically what we call state RIFRAs, State Religious Freedom Restoration Act. These are laws that would make it easier to basically demand religious exemption to generally applicable laws, like non-discrimination laws. Um, those are out there. There are bills to allow uh, religious objections to, um, to basically health professionals, guidance counselors, people who do health and service work to assert their religious views uh, to discriminate in the course of providing that care um, or guidance to people. Uh, there are bills also specifically targeted in the adoption context that would allow people who do child placement work for say adoptions or foster care placement to use their religious views about LGBT people um, to deny, actually deny placements to, to children in families um, with LGBT members, even if those people are their family members. Um, and we've actually seen a law like that recently just pass in, in South Dakota. So there, and, and there's also tons of bills out there, unfortunately, that um, are trying, still trying to provide exemptions to people or businesses um, with respect to things related to marriage. So it is an active, active part of what the states are trying to do. Um, I will just point out a couple of things that we're doing here in California. This was an area of the law we were actually very actively working on before the Trump administration, um, because here, particularly in the context of healthcare, religious refusal uh, and discrimination in, in the course of providing healthcare um, is actually a very big deal because we have a, um, a lot of Catholic hospitals. We have uh, the largest Catholic hospital system uh, in the country is here, Dignity Health. Um, it's actually the largest in the nation. It's the biggest, fifth biggest hospital provider in California. And they, you know, actively discriminate against trans people. They actively deny a whole host of reproductive health care to, to people. And we have, like to talk about it more in question, we have multiple lawsuits against them at the moment um, for a whole host of things. And we're trying to develop the law in a way that basically says, look, you have to provide medical care that people need. And using non-medical reasons to not deny people care is a problem. We're using a lot of California law to try to establish that. Um, and we're doing it in the context of reproductive health care and also um, in the context of transition-related care uh, for trans people. So more on that soon. Um, one more depressing topic uh, to note before at least moving to like one or two positive things. I think a, a panel about the Trump administration right now would be a little remiss if we didn't you know, mention, though they have failed for the moment, the, the unmistakable effort to destroy the healthcare infrastructure that is out there in the world. Obviously, we just saw HCA repeal completely crash and burn, yay. Um, but, you know, I think we're seeing this sort of, you know, whether it's fostering or not, um, this idea that they're not going to completely let it go. And I mention that here because both ACA repeal the substantial changes they wanted to make to the Medicaid system and the defunding of Planned Parenthood, all of which was rolled up into one, one nice little package, particularly the last two, I don't think they're going to give up on in, in any way. And those things will have a significantly devastating effect on LGBTQ and HIV positive people. And so we've done um, a good mobilization and advocacy work, but also you know, we're doing a lot of work to support Planned Parenthood to be ready uh, to, to file lawsuits if defunding happens, and, and basically, you know, helping them kind of figure out, you know, what the impact would be here. So that's something that we would do. Something else in California, if you to, uh, you know, fight for better health care, there is actually a bill this year um, that would to create a single-payer health care system in California. Um, the ACLU was working on that and supporting that, and I think some other groups as well. 
Um, so if you want to follow something positive, there's that. Um, two last notes. One of the big issues that we work on here in California in particular, though it's obviously some federal overlays, is decreasing profiling and incarceration of LGBTQ people. And, you know, if you get caught up in the system trying to improve your safety and conditions, you are incarcerated, um, either in criminal justice uh, situations or immigration detention. And, you know, the big shift on this, on this front happening on the national level, I'll just note that, you know, just in the last week, uh, Attorney General Sessions, um, but, um, but, uh, but, you know, he basically issued a, you know, kind of stock order and massive uh, review of all of the agreements that the Justice Department had painstakingly worked out with a number of police departments over the last, you know, four-ish years, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, get my years wrong. Um, I name that here because a lot of those agreements, you know, obviously, LGBTQ people are disproportionately profiled and policed and incarcerated, and all of that work to create systemic police reform has a direct impact on our community, and in particular, a number of those agreements actually had specific provisions concerning, for example, profiling of transgender people and sort of appropriate police interaction um, with LGBTQ people in particular. So that is a bad thing. Um, the other two things that we're doing a lot of work on is work to implement the Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, which as of right now, it doesn't see, that one I think is like flying under the radar. I don't think the Trump administration has done it quite yet. Um, and so all of these great protections that are in place um, to help keep everyone safe in jails, but particularly LGBTQ people, um, are still alive and well, and we have a lot of litigation going on in California, and also a lot of advocacy with, with county jails. Um, since I don't want to take up too, too much time, I'll mention two other things. Uh, on front, we are helping to implement a new California law that uh, both prohibits uh, gender profiling and requires data tracking of gender profiling. And also something that Williams Institute has had a lot on, and we greatly appreciated their input as we were figuring out what are like the ideal regulations and instructions to give cops who now have to sit down and fill out forms about their perceptions of people's you know, gender. Um, so thank you for that, <laughs> for that help. Um, but we're hoping that that data collection will help us make the case you know, that there is profiling and, and figure out how to stop it. On a happy note, the last thing I'll say, at least here in California that we're doing, is we're trying to kind of like win the war you know, the long game way. We are doing a lot of work to implement um, our very groundbreaking uh, sex ed law that we um, got passed about two years ago that mandates comprehensive sex ed, but also um, is the first state to require LGBTQ and gender inclusive sex ed in schools. Um, and we're, we're, we're coming a long way, and a lot of schools are really doing it. So, um, you know, when I get depressed about the Trump administration, I at least try to think about all the, like, generations of people now we're trying to, like, educate here that will be the, like, Following up with something positive because I'm supposed to be speaking about immigration, but I will say this: I think like one observation we can all make positive that's coming out of this Trump administration is that being a lawyer is back in fashion again, <laughs> and that I think that all of us at least are guaranteed work for. Um, and I think it's something that we wouldn't have necessarily said 10 years ago, being public interest lawyers. Um, so with that. Uh, I, I just wanted to sort of add to my intro a lot of the work that I've been doing over my, I guess, my career as an immigrant rights attorney has been focusing on defending um, LGBTQ asylum seekers. So these are individuals who have come to the United States and wanted refuge under our laws. They were entitled to that refuge. They came here knowing that because of the sort of image that America put out in the world is that we are our protectors in the guards of human rights. Um, and so come to our shore, like the Statue of Liberty, right, that we associate with, with this country and our values. So naturally, the United States has been a huge refuge for the LGBTQ immigrant community, as well as individuals living with HIV and AIDS. Um, so that being said, you know, I think what I'd like to sort of speak to you first about is what was happening prior to the 45th becoming the 45th. Um, that's, I refuse to acknowledge our new president. Um, and, and what's happening today? What, you know, what's the sort of the change um, in landscape? So 
you know, under the prior administration, as LGBTQ like advocacy groups and direct services organizations, we were really focusing on improving access to justice, improving access to LGBTQ survivors of torture and persecution, or individuals who fear that they might suffer torture and persecution if they're actually deported or removed or forced to return to their home country, um, getting them access to counsel. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing as an equal justice work fellow as a staff attorney was representing individuals who were detained um, in immigration court and, and fighting their cases. Um, and so on that front, you know, I, it's taken us, I think, you know, Shannon worked a lot. I think one of your first sort of major decisions was recognizing persecution based on um, the Hernandez Montiel case. Um, and that was, I think, 2001. Around there, yeah. yeah, so that was a Ninth Circuit case. There was that case as well as another, um, I can't now, it's like escaping me. But in any case, the Ninth Circuit was one of the few initial jurisdictions to recognize um, gender identity as a protected ground um, for individuals seeking asylum or protection under the Convention Against Torture. Um, you know, for a long time they'd already been recognizing sexual orientation as, as a basis, but um, no doubt across the country you see a lot of misconception, you know, and just horrific ways of applying in and deciding whether to, to actually recognize if someone has made a meritorious claim. So just to give you an example, for a long time um, at the asylum office, if you're a gay applicant for protection, uh, the person interviewing you will be like, well, you know, you don't look very gay to me. I want you to walk. And they would literally take them out to the hallway and make them walk in front of them and see if, like, oh, yeah, I think that you're a little bit feminine, so therefore you've met the test. So, you know, there, there's that type of prejudice that existed for years and years and years, and there's still in some parts of this country where that still happens. You know, I know, shocking to the conscience. Um, but, and so I think that, you know, under prior administrations, the work for a lot of, for a lot of us is to educate, to educate the court, to educate the administration. Um, or you know the the, bureauc the bureaucratic offices that were that were looking at these claims, and you know and there was in different parts of the country, different groups, immigration equality as well as the National Immigrant Justice Center, um, and and I think the National Center for Lesbian Rights they were able to make a lot of play and breakthrough. Um, in addition, you know a lot of the work that I was working on was trying to correct a lot of misinformed law. So. You know, one of the decisions that came out by the Ninth Circuit, so the Ninth Circuit's strange, because I, it, well, it's not that strange, I think everyone knows. Um, there is, like, some really great justices that we have that are very pro-progressive LGBTQ rights, and then there's a lot of conservative ones that where you get a lot of horrific case law from. We spend, like, 10 years trying to overturn that. Um, and so that's kind of exactly what happened in, in the situation that I'm dealing with. The Ninth Circuit in 2008 issued this decision, Castro Martinez versus Holder. Um, it involved a, a gay, HIV-positive male from Mexico. The individual had suffered horrific sexual abuse as a child. And during his testimony, he made it very obvious that, in fact, the reason for this abuse and persecution was undoubtedly because of his sexual orientation. Um, he was, you know, there was homophobic slurs, insults made to him by his family, um, and, and his abuser. Um, nevertheless, when the court... The, the, it was, the case was denied before the immigration judge said, well, you know, actually, this abuse you suffered, it may have been persecution, but the fact that, like, Mexico City has gay, gay pride parades and there is gay marriage laws that are being passed, you don't have a fear of persecution. You're going to be fine. The law is going to protect you. The Board of Immigrant Appeals, which is, like, the second um, administrative level um, of Board of Appeals, said, yeah, we agree. Everything's fine in Mexico. This case goes to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit says, yeah, this is, like, really bad. I mean, this, it's bad that you suffered this, um, but we're actually not going to say that this is persecution because there's no evidence in the record that you could have, couldn't have actually reported this to the government. There's no evidence in the record that the Mexican police or the government, if they knew about this abuse that you were suffering as a child, that they wouldn't have stepped in and tried to protect you. Mind you, this abuse took place in the 80s and the 90s, and if you look at the country condition reports, I mean, it's, there's, there was no such thing as even child protective like services in Mexico existing at that time. 
let alone any sort of awareness or steps to actually want to protect individuals who are or being abused because of their sexual orientation. Um, and similarly, the Ninth Circuit said, and actually we also agree with the lower courts. Because there's gay rights parades happening in Mexico, and because there's also been like, you know, discrimination laws that have been passed, and there is same-sex marriage that's been um, legalized in Mexico City, we don't think if you went back, nothing is gonna happen to you. You're gonna be safe. Unfortunately, that and that decision when that came out, I mean the next day we saw scores of people getting like across the country because the impact, I mean, this is the, the beauty and it's like the blessing and a curse sometimes of working in the Ninth Circuit is that it's one of the most prolific courts when it comes to immigration jurisprudence. Um, and so what the Ninth Circuit does ends up having a huge impact on the rest of the country in terms of how other circuit courts are going to interpret their law, whether they're going to side with the Ninth Circuit or not. So for the Ninth Circuit to take this position, um, it really just, you know, it had a really, an instant, horrible impact, where we started seeing most, like, if not all, claims coming from people with sexual orientation claims, saying that they fear persecution because they're gay or because they're lesbian. Um, if they're, even if it wasn't from Mexico, it didn't matter what part of the world they were coming from, they were being denied. Especially if you suffered harm by private actors, and you fail to go and report that, and you didn't report it because you're being LGBTQ is stigmatized in your culture. You could, by reporting it, even suffer more harm. That didn't matter. So the fact that you didn't report it, they were like, you know what? You don't have persecution. And if there's any laws on the books in your country that says that sexual orientation is protected, then you're good. You're going to be protected. But in fact, the evidence on the ground that we have and that is continuing to grow is that the LGBTQ community in Mexico and many parts of the world is people are every day suffering torture and harm because of that identity, because of the lifestyle, because of who they are. And it's not accepted and it's definitely not, I mean, there's a considerable, just taking Mexico as an example, you know, the country at the higher echelons of government might have said, you know, we're going to go ahead and ask, um, same-sex marriage laws, we're going to go ahead and have these discrimination laws on the books because we want to look really good. We want to look really good to the tourist class that comes to Mexico and visits and, and all the resorts. But, but in fact, if you look on the ground, the reality on the ground tells you otherwise. There's been a huge backlash in Mexico against passage of these laws, against sort of an increase of these rights. Um, so basically, my work and my mission became to take to task this decision because of, oh gosh, I only have two minutes left. I haven't even gone to the impact of the Trump administration. Sorry. Um, anyway, time to do that. Okay, okay. So the good news is this year, in an en banc decision, the Ninth Circuit overruled Castro Martinez and recognized how wrong they were and said, actually, a child, a gay child who can't report but who suffers for this type of harm because of sexual orientation, that person has suffered persecution, and that person deserves our protection. Huge. Um, another sort of, so anyway, it's all to say a lot of the, the work that we were doing prior under the administration, or under prior administration, was to work on these sort of more specific issues that would impact individuals' asylum claims. And we were working on detention conditions, improving the rights of people who are detained so they'd be protected for, from the harm that Melissa has described. Um, today, we're in a, operating under a very different reality. You know, the administration from the get-go made it very clear that their enforcement, their one of their priorities was going to get immigrants out. It didn't matter if you had lawful status or not, and in fact, we're seeing that immediately. Um, the LGBTQ community, community is very much going, has been directly impacted. Anyone who's basically now being attended by law enforcement, anyone who's overstayed status, Anyone who's violated immigration law in any way, ICE is coming out to pick them up. And they're throwing them in their detention facilities. Um, they're not, they're as to the extent possible, they're trying to get around, do process rights, and quickly deport these individuals. Um, so suffice to say, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the immigration front.
So I'm Rick Sabur. I'm the Executive Director of Equality California. And first of all, uh, Brad, thank you for the invitation here. Um, you know, the Williams Institute really is one of our strongest partners. It's sort of a, for what we do, which is um, legislative and government advocacy, uh, as well as sort of education out in the community um, and political mobilization, the um, Williams Institute really is uh, it's a symbiotic, really natural partnership because we rely so much on the important research and work that the Institute does. Um, it's almost like, you know, we know as LGBT people the lives that we live, uh, but when we're talking to legislators and uh, members of, um, and policymakers, you know, the fact that we uh, know that we've been discriminated against or that we face lack of acceptance or that there are impacts of those things, we can say those things, but the Williams Institute really sort of takes what we know and we feel in our guts our lived equality and really shows through research um, that in fact those things are the case. And so we really rely on that. And I know that folks at NCLR and ACLU and as part of their uh, legal work do the same thing. So thank you so much and thank you Chuck for having the vision to really create this uh, important uh, part of our community. Um, so when Donald Trump was elected, you know, after um, feeling like I was um, hit in the gut um, and literally um, breaking into tears as I saw uh, uh, Hillary give her concession, we took a step up and we said, look at what is it that we need to do to protect our community? And so we put together a plan and it includes uh, three components. One was uh, we knew we had to be in Washington, D.C., so we immediately opened the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, Valerie Plimpus is there on the ground, began on January 1, so we needed to sort of be part of the advocacy, focusing on the Californian in the GOP Californians, also bringing that information back. But the second part of our plan, which is really to um, engage in political and community mobilization in California, uh, with the goal of really breaking this GOP wall that we envisioned would occur and which we're seeing is happening. Um, we knew that there are seven congressional districts here in the state of California uh, that were won by Hillary Clinton in which we have uh, Republicans holding those seats. Um, and so political and community mobilization is a key element of trying to really break this GOP lock and, and trying to sort of peel them away on some of the key issues that we care about. Um, and then the third component was really pushing ahead on our agenda in, here in California, showing that California continues to be a beacon of hope for LGBT people and that we were not going to let them put us on the defensive uh, alone and we would continue with working with any partners to really advance cutting edge uh, bills here in California and, and really raise California up, um, as, as I said, as a beacon of hope. Um, so uh, moving back to um, our federal advocacy, I think you've heard a lot of what uh, we've been focused on. I think the one thing we'll say is, you know, in addition to um, really doing some advocacy around the uh, Obama executive orders, the reality of that is that their executive orders, um, the Trump administration doesn't have people to talk to. Um, there's 500 and some positions uh, that are sort of below the cabinet level that haven't even been proposed. So uh, we knew that really our focus needs to be on Congress and on the things that Congress controls. Um, our, key, our key and probably our most important um, objective is really to preserve the Affordable Care Act. Um, we know how important that was to our community in a whole host of respects. It made um, medical care available for the first time for transgender people. Um, it made, uh, we know that LGBT people were underinsured for two reasons and, and, and others, but the primary ones was that um, we had high levels of pre-existing conditions, high rates of people living with HIV as a pre-existing condition, uh, women who hadn't born children having medical conditions that made pre-existing conditions a bar to people having health care um, in California and across the country, uh, which was um, addressed by the Affordable Care Act. And then, of course, the economic disparities, which so much of the work that the Williams Institute has demonstrated, is that our community um, is, is, um, faces economic disparities that make health care coverage out of reach and with a barrier to care. Um, you know, so there are a lot of other elements of that, but we put together a, 
a set of objectives um, about what needed to be preserved under the Affordable Care Act and frankly have been both advocating for that and actually coupling that with mobilization efforts in these seven districts in California. There's three in the Central Valley, there's three in Orange County, and then of course uh, Daryl Issa's district down in San, the San Diego area. And um, we were uh, responsible for, I think, having about half of the folks at the Daryl Issa Town Hall. We've been partnering with the Orange County Center. Did a mobilization training out there, uh, which we basically sent one email out to our group and to their, um, their, their members and uh, expecting to have 30 or 40 people who wanted to do a mobilization and 300 people showed up. So there really is energy there and I think looking for direction. We're hiring an on the ground organizer in the Central Valley and one and down in Orange County really with the goal of trying to sort of break this. Um, we're also gonna be looking at sort of the political element of that and um, I frankly are sort of looking for funding to sort of do television in those markets that uh, we can mail in those markets so we can. These seven Republicans have never faced a real re-election fight. They don't get communication in the district by opponents. Um, and I, I, I am confident that with doing some polling and by basically doing some significant mail programs in this district that we can scare the shit out of them. And we need to do that because we need to actually get the breaks um, in the districts that are most purple in the country and we happen to have seven of them, seven of about 14 right here in California. Um, we also you know, have been working with our colleagues on, um, uh, on the religious exemption. You know, that seemed to go away because uh, reportedly Ivanka um, convinced father that it wouldn't be a good thing right now. But we are also hearing reports that it's still live. Um, the religious right is pushing that. They feel confidence is gonna happen. Uh, there is a legal strategy out there uh, in which all of our, um, uh, our, our, our legal guardians of uh, uh, Lambda Legal and the ACLU and NCLR have a coordinated strategy. There will be lawsuits filed by all of them. Uh, it will be the, uh, the plaintiff that NCLR and Kirkland will be representing in the case that's brought in the Ninth Circuit. So um, yeah, I know that we're preparing for that. We've been preparing for a couple months now. Um, the... Um, uh, we're also, um, you know, we're also seeing this spread of um, anti-LGBT laws across the country. And last year, we adopted, uh, we sponsored uh, AB 1887, which imposed a travel ban on state-funded travel to states that adopt new laws to discriminate, focusing on North Carolina with HB 2. But that also has been um, imposed on um, uh, four other states. Uh, we've been working with all of our colleagues here on this table, uh, really trying to sort of, um, uh, with, the, with the adoption of the new repeal law, um, make sure that people understand that, you know, that really wasn't. That, that is a law that wrote discrimination into the law. It basically tells addictions that they can't, that they can't adopt uh, LGBT uh, protections until 2020. It looks like it's really pretty confusing, but it also continues to void those that are out there. Um, under the terms of 18, uh, AB 1887, the travel ban that's in place for North Carolina should remain in place, and we've all been working hard um, to advocate that the Attorney General uh, reaffirm the travel ban because we do think that it's going to be important that the NCAA does not um, uh, allow one of these tournament games to take place um, in, uh, in uh, North Carolina or any of the other states. Um, we also think we have to look outside to the Senate. Um, you know, we can't do everything. We do have, let me see, I've got about another two minutes. Uh, we, there are, there are uh, seven senators who voted, or six that are sort of in moderate states, that voted to repeal the filibuster. Um, and, uh, you know, they included folks like Rob Portman and Susan Collins, Lisa Zabrankowski, and then the two Arizona senators. But I think our focus is probably going to be, we'll take, we're probably going to take on Nevada uh, Dean Heller is in the most Democratic state held by Republican. He shouldn't have done that. Um, and we're going to basically need to uh, make sure that he understands that, uh, that there's a cost for this um, and that, um, you know, what they did was really undermining the checks and balances that have been put in place for 200 years to make sure that extreme decisions were not made and extreme appointments to the, to the Supreme Court and the federal bench. Um, and we need to uh, deal with that. Um, last thing. Um, I think I only have about a minute. 
Uh, I think we gave you the materials on our, uh, on our legislative agenda. We are pushing ahead. We have important bills that are cutting edge, uh, 12 of them that's our most robust California legislative package that we've ever had. Um, it includes a, a bill that I know the Williams Institute has been advocating and actually brought us in into the coalition, uh, Equality California, that will, um, uh, amend, that will modernize the HIV uh, criminalization laws, um, uh, which basically are um, stigmatized people and discriminative against people living with HIV. Uh, we've got another uh, law that actually makes it easy to change gender markers uh, for government agencies that's um, advanced by um, Tony Atkins and Scott Wiener. Uh, we have a, another bill that uh, puts in place very specific um, a specific bill of rights, but covering um, LGBT seniors who are in long-term care facilities so that they can't forced to room with someone who's homophobic or kicked out or, 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 moved, or, or not allowed to room with sort of a partner in the same room that appropriate gender pronouns are used in a number of protections in long-term care facilities. Um, we're, we're continuing to push ahead on data collection, which has been a key priority of the Williams Institute. Uh, we passed a bill last year that actually requires state, uh, the state to gather data on LGBT people in the healthcare area. We've got a new bill that extends that to the agencies that govern education um, and employment. Uh, we've got two um, hate crimes bills, which you can uh, read about. Um, and then, of course, we've got um, uh, another bill that actually uh, will require insurance coverage for lipodystrophy, uh, which is not considered medically necessary by California health care plans. And we've got a number of others. Um, but really, the, the goal is that we're not going to stop moving things ahead here in California, we have to do three things. We've got to fight like hell in Washington. We've got to actually mobilize our communities here on the ground and be strategic about it. And I think for us here in California, it's focusing on the seven congressional districts here in California and probably Nevada, the state Senate race. We've been doing a lot of mobilization there in Nevada already. And so we're working with HRC and some of the other national groups there. So we need to do that mobilization. And then lastly, move ahead in California, show that we can actually pass some of these really cutting edge bills and that we're going to do it uh, despite what's happening in Washington. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all our panelists um, for their inspiring presentations and also for sticking to the time frame, um, which means that we can actually have this be a discussion. So if people have specific questions they'd like to ask, this is a good time to do it. <coughs> Please um, stand at a mic. Good afternoon, and thank you so much. It's really a tremendous opportunity to hear you. Um, not to take, my name is Sarah Blanche, and um, not to take us in further into a negative direction, but you touched on it. It's obviously um, uh, a huge uh, uh, development today that Gorsuch was officially confirmed. I just would love to hear more reflections on what that portends for LGBTQ rights. And I mean, my understanding is that he is an originalist, and does that necessarily mean that he will always come down against uh, expansions of LGBTQ rights? It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Yes, I am very concerned. I mean, the saw there was a huge outpouring of opposition to his nomination to the court from the LGBT community, from one groups, from uh, the NAACP, Legal Defense and Education Fund, from immigrants rights groups. It's not just that he's uh, an originalist, uh, although that is that is of concern because you know that means he's you know of the view that our statutory and constitutional protections are frozen in time and that you have to go back and look at the worldview and intentions of the people who enacted them. I mean, there's a really great example of why that is so dangerous for us in this recent Seventh Circuit decision that came out well where the court held that Title VII protects uh, against sexual orientation discrimination. There was a dissenting opinion. It was a great decision. Eight, of the, eight out of 11 judges voted the right way. There were three judges who dissented. There was a dissenting opinion written by uh, Diane Seitz, who was on the Trump shortlist for nomination to the Supreme Court, and I'm sure will stay on that list if he gets another appointment. And she violently disagreed with the ruling that Title VII protects 
gay people uh, because she said there's no doubt. She quoted Justice Scalia, who, of course, such as replacing him, Justice Scalia was also a quote-unquote original. And um, Judge Sykes quoted Scalia and said, you know, this is terrible. There's no doubt in my mind. He went back and asked the members of Congress who enacted Title VII uh, at the time it was proposed and enacted, did you intend this to protect gay people? They would have said, no, it should be the end of the matter. So that's the kind of reasoning we have before to. But there's so much more about him. He doesn't believe in fundamental rights, uh, which would include the right to privacy, the right to marry, uh, the right to raise your children as you see fit. He, he's one of those judges, now justices, that believe that there are no so-called unenumerated fundamental rights. Very scary. The only fundamental right he has shown any belief in is the so-called right to life, and in his view, right, life gives a conception. <laughs> so, I mean, he is a, he, his, his positions are extremely right-wing and conservative. So, yeah, we get in his terrible views on religious freedom. I don't know, Melissa, you want to talk about that? But. Well, I, will, I, mean, I agree with everything Shannon said, and it's, it's a time to be concerned. I wish that there was something more positive to say. You know, there are people who have come to surprise once they're Supreme Court justices, and you know, you never know. But you know, as we like to say, you know, about Trump, it's like you know, I like to kind of believe what people say and kind of take them and take them at their word. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot to look at. I will say that the so the ACLU does not take positions on on um, Supreme Court nominations or, or any nominations, but we do. Um, every time there is a Supreme Court uh, nominee, write a report about their civil liberties record. And so if you want to Google ACLU Gorsuch reports, that actually will be enough to get you to it. Um, and it's broken down by categories. And there's a section on religious liberty, um, LGBT rights, and, and, and other topics you may care about. Um, and there's not a lot of good news in there. <laughs> and I would, I would also add that for all judicial appointments um, to all the federal courts, all go to the website to the Alliance for Justice, which is um, the premier organization in the country that that assesses um, the, the qualifications of those who are appointed to the federal bench to um, c carry out an inclusive vision of American society. And they did a scathing report on the court. Yes. One thing I'll oh, sort of, sorry. One thing I'll sort of add is that, you know, I think we had a um, uh, the craziness of the Trump administration. I think made it hard for the public and our community to focus because there's just so much coming out at us. Um, but this next appointment, I think, is going to be really important. And the thing that's going to be harder about the next appointment is that the filibuster rules are gone. But we, there still is a path to making sure that someone crazy and extremely right-wing doesn't get in there. And I think we have to start thinking now about the political tools to use, right? We need to keep three Republicans from voting for someone who's extreme. And so that means focusing on the three states, you know, five states, six states. Um, and I think it basically means that we've got to be doing public education campaigns. We need to be on TV. We need to make sure that there is a real cost in a finite focused number of states, and we've got to probably start really soon. Um, because, of course, you know, we're going to live with court if another one comes in for 20 or 30 years. Uh, someone had a question over here. Would you like to come back to the mic, please? That's not the mic. Yeah. Uh, during the campaign, uh, <clears throat> Trump referred to a list of about 20 proposed justices. I wonder if anyone's familiar with they, uh, if they're all basically the, the same or some uh, uh, less, more moderate or less hostile than, than some of the others. We're all extremely conservative. I think I think they're you know to some degree. Some would be, some are slightly more moderate than others. Yeah, but there's nobody, it would be hard to uh, feel really, uh, you know, uh, 
confident that any of any of the on that list had a commitment to, you know, these these values that are so important. I mean, this isn't. And I, Rick, I love what you said. I can't think of nothing more important for our community to be focused on than the possibility that our current president will have another uh, shot at putting another justice on the court. And part of that, I think, of our message is not just about I think our interests. But these are these are like the fundamental constitutional and political values that are at the heart of our country about freedom and equality and not turning back the clock on vulnerable minority groups. So that we've got to do better, I think, at getting those messages out, including to those critical few Republicans that we're going to need to hold the line. That was a great question, though. Yeah, thank you. And again, I would refer you to the Alliance for Justice because they did report on a number of the names of people who are on the list. Yes. Thank you so much for all of your comments. My name is Lori Meyer. Rick, you and I know each other. I practice exclusively in the area of reproductive law and enjoy California's progressive statute worldwide for LGBT clients truly throughout the world. It's very exciting what we've been able to achieve. And I'm concerned about the future for reproductive rights, and I'm wondering if all of you might comment briefly on how um, the current administration might impact that. Sure. I'll start, because I think it, I may be the only one where it's my job title. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I mean, sometimes I hate coming to these things because I feel so negative, but I do, there's like enormous power that we have to fight back, and actually I think, you know, fighting back the ACA repeal and Planned Parenthood defunding was like massively, you know, I think that, I'll, I'll get to the answer to your question in a, in a second, but I think we need to, you know, fight against the narrative that took hold a little bit that, you know, it was, you know, the Freedom Caucus that, like, saved that thing for us, right? Like, no, what what we all did and the mobilization that we did, the targeted town hall work, that that kind of work, the people speaking out and, you know, the one in five and many more allies, you know, people who have, like, used Planned Parenthood services throughout the nation, like, speaking out, that created a political climate that was very difficult for um, congressional representatives to vote the wrong way. And we had a lot to do with that. So, so while I'm about to say it's a very dire time, it is not a hopeless time, um, what I will say is that, look, like, there is no question that the current federal administration and the majority of members of Congress would like to severely lack access to reproductive health care, very specifically abortion. Um, the Gorsuch, not, you know, I can stop saying nomination now. The Gorsuch, um, you know, appointment um, is not good news um, when it comes to whether, you know, the fundamental, you know, privacy rights that we all have um, to, to um, the health care we need is, is secure. I think that they, while the administration, I think, will continue persistently to issue executive orders, issue regulations, do what it can to chip away access to reproductive health care. I believe that we can stop. The things that we can stop politically, we, we will stop. The things that we can stop in the courts, like we are ready. We are ready to sue about them. And it's why the courts are so important. We are back in one of those times in our country where the, the, the courts are a place that's going to save us. You know, we've seen it with, you know, Trump's executive orders and immigration. You know, it's like, it's why we have that institution. We need to keep it as strong as possible. It's why the judicial nominations matter matter the most. But you know, we're seeing we're seeing changes. You know, the leaked executive order, as I said, I is they're trying to make it very easy for employers to deny access to reproductive health care. We're we have a piece of litigation. Um, Currently, where we were already in, under the Obama administration, actually suing the Office, Office of Refugee Resettlement for allowing just contractors, um, it, largely the, you know, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, who are responsible for providing care to unaccompanied immigrant minors, so young people who come to this country without, without their parents. Um, they're responsible for providing all their health care, but many of those grantees who take care of those young people refuse to provide them with um, abortion and contraception services. We're hearing, you know, rumors that now only now are they like turning a blind eye to that, but also affirmatively trying to block access um, to reproductive health care for people in their care. So there are shifts that are happening, but we are very ready, very poised to take on those challenges. Yes. Yeah. 
Alan Sturtz, and I'm currently living on the central coast of California, so I'd like to get a little more local in terms of the state. Melissa, I'm interested in how the implementation of the sex ed regulations are going, because I'm hearing about charter schools who are not complying. Yes, you, so thank you for that. Um, first of all, actually, generally, public schools in your area seem to be doing well so far. Um, so I will say that. Um, there's a very active um, coalition, you may not already be a member, but I believe that you are, um, working on, working on um, real on-the-ground implementations using toolkits that lots of um, organizations have put together. Um, we also, so folks know if you're interested, we have a very specific checklist on um, we feel you Southern California or Northern California's website about what it looks like to have LGBTQ or gender inclusive instruction, kind of a checklist that schools can use. Here's the rub. So charter schools, um, there are certain laws charter schools absolutely have to comply with. Non-discrimination rules, 100% absolutely. Laws about what you have to teach in the classroom are traditionally, with some exceptions, laws that charter schools do not have to follow. So the technical answer is that Charter schools are not specifically required to follow this new law that we passed called the California Healthy Youth Act. With that said, charter schools do have to teach to the health standards. And we think that the health standards, what that means is complying with like the rules for what comprehensive sex ed looks like, which is the California Healthy Youth Act. So charter schools are a challenge because we have a little bit less of a, you know, there's the carrot and there's the stick. Our stick is not as strong. With, with the charter schools, um, but we are working actually with a number of charter schools that like voluntarily want to do the right thing, and we're trying to create a few more models of those folks to kind of shame their peers. So we're working on that. But thank you for raising it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll do it because Latham, uh, I was supposed to this afternoon at the Latham Lawyers Affinity Group, and then when this was moved up, uh, they were all here today into the room, uh, <laughs> including our board member Jason Daniels. But Latham is actually helping Equality California on a new program called the Safe and Support. Doing and what uh, and we this is something that uh, ACLU and NCLR, Latino Equality Alliance, the uh, California Teachers Association, the CFT, um, the the Superintendent of Public Instruction are all partnering with us. So we've had a number of advisory groups uh, as we're developing this basically this metric that measures. Uh, a whole host of things in schools, uh, both school climate, uh, whether they're complying with curriculum, uh, all of these things, and they'll actually end up getting a score uh, and with detailed information that will be publicly released and will, it will actually give um, all of us an ability to go to school districts and um, advocate as to why they're not uh, helping LGBT kids in a better way and complying with the law. Um, and actually people in local jurisdictions. So I think we're, we've actually got the metric uh, done. Latham has been doing this pro bono. I think they've given us over $300,000 in pro bono time uh, over the course of the last year. And the goal really is to get this uh, completed. The superintendent of public instruction is now reviewing it and giving us some feedback. And our goal is really to get it out in the field at these school districts um, in the fall and over the course of the next school year actually be able to publicly release it. Time for one more question. Um, there's two people. Can try to how how about if you each ask your questions and um, then we'll let everybody answer them together. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for your interesting talks. Uh, my name is Maria. I work for the Embassy of the Netherlands. Uh, and although I really appreciate your active legal responding to the current government, I'm also wondering how can we work together on LGBT issues more positively, like constructively? Maybe, Mr. Spur, you have suggestions on that? Because you were saying you were fighting in D.C. now <laughs> to work together with Republican Congress people. So I'm just wondering how we can work on that. Uh, you, you mean with the Netherlands or, or just generally? Um, so partly for, like as a country that wants to work with the U.S. in general, but also um, from the embassy, uh, we're working on several LGBT issues. and. Obviously, it's harder for us now to work together with Congress than it was before. So, we let the last person ask a question and then sure. give everybody. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Adriel Rodriguez. I organize in Orange County and Los Angeles for transgender communities. Uh, something that uh, wasn't brought up, and I just want to uh, definitely bring it up and see if you can talk to it, is the disproportional violence that happens to trans women of color and what kind of 
uh, resources uh, you may be allocating to your organizations for that. Additionally, Santa Ana City Council uh, through local organizations was able to cancel the ICE contract uh, where currently 30 trans women of color are being detained and are now looking for um, people to sponsor them to stay here in California. Um, and if you have like any additional updates, I don't have too much information about that, but I think it's definitely the, the things that are happening in Tenet and are re really important to bring up as well. Thank you. So, what, Rick, you want to respond to either of those and then we'll just go down the line and see if people want to have last comments and responses to our last two questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, in terms of, our focus hasn't been so much, I think, um, in terms of the um, uh, ways that we can work with um, uh, governments outside of the United States that are sort of uh, wanting to work with us, uh, I think, you know, really, um, you know, lies in whatever tools you have to communicate with the Trump administration, although we recognize there aren't a lot of people to communicate with there. Um, I, you know, my, my, my view is that, um, you know, and, and when I use the fighting language, I actually do think we have to fight. I mean, I think we actually have to take our gloves off and we need to basically get out in communities. Um, we need to organ, we know that uh, more than a majority of the American people are with us on all of our issues. Um, and we need to organize them, and we need to make sure that people that are that elected officials in those districts understand that there is a uh, more of a cost in uh, sticking with Tea Party folks than there is um, in voting against the interests of of the people in their district than um, than not. And so, um, some of that is the mobilization. Um, you know, the other thing I would sort of say is. Um, uh, for those of you, and I know there's many folks here uh, in the room, I think we're going to look back if we get another Supreme Court justice here and we're basically say, um, you know, the, the, the angels in our community that I think are with us really need to understand that um, putting some money into these states with really focused, high-profile political campaigns. I mean, we saw the other side on this Gorsuch thing the other day. You know, they had their... They have this ad with him um, where he seems like the nicest, you know, most, it's like a Ken doll out there who never hurts anyone. And, um, you know, they're putting, the other side's putting money into these kinds of campaigns, and our side isn't. We need to be doing that, and we need to do it in a focused way. We need to figure out where we can move folks, and we need to start thinking about where we're going to get three votes. And it means, um, it means some communication, and it means high profile communication in certain areas. I don't think I answered the question. And then I think in terms of um, in terms of ICE, I think you know there's been some legislation here in California that we've been supportive of uh, about not having um, some of these private detention centers, um, and all of California supported that. Um, I think you know obviously uh, all of the organizations here were part of uh, Transform California, which was our transgender education program that I think was really aimed at trying to make sure you know educate the broader community, including the LGBT community, but the broader community about really the challenges and the level of violence uh, that transgender people face, and also um, the contributions and the gifts that they bring to our community. So, um, so just to, I know this, like you were asking more sort of directly on the LGBT, sort of how the Netherlands can help. One thing that just sort of struck me, something that we, for the LGBT immigrant community, and this is true both in the United States, those who are refugees or asylum seekers in the Netherlands. Um, I think that country conditional reports, so a lot of different countries, including our own through the Department of State, uh, either within our own foreign department agencies will do, you know, sort of have um, investigative reporting or just country conditions analysis done um, for all the sort of different countries in the world. And, you know, I think one of the ways that Netherlands could help is to have something that's actually really focused on global, on looking at, like, LGBT rights globally and, you know, and how countries are doing with that. Because I think the more resources and information we can get, that will help the cause globally as well as domestically. Um, and so with respect to the other issue of um, 
fixed rates locally in, in Orange County, actually in, in Southern California. I did, I ran out of time because I'm not very good at that show when it comes to speaking, and I apologize. Uh, but one of the things, you know, has been one of the big victories for our community um, has been to push out immigration and to really sort of uh, fight against you know, the increased deportation and increased detention that we're seeing amongst of all immigrant communities, but definitely in particular the LGBTQ community. Um, under the Obama administration, one of the things, a positive thing that had happened was that they had, in response to PRIA, in response to violence against trans detainees, um, they came up with a trans care put, like, uh, guidelines memo, which was basically um, one of the things that it did was it created a protective custody mod at the Santa Ana jail where only trans women would be placed. Eventually, the idea was that they would then be also allowed to um, integrate with the cisgender female population. And it, before it didn't get to there yet, but um, and part of that memo was to also not, I mean, the, it was the policy intent was to not hold trans detainees in detention and to to prioritize releasing them as quickly as possible. So this program of sponsoring them, what that means is basically, as I said before, a lot of the LGBTQ community, um, if not all, is seeking asylum and protection under our laws. And so for the trans population, this means that once they've made that presentation known to the agency, to ICE, as well as to the court, they could be eligible to get released from detention, be able to fight their cases outside of detention. But in order for them to do that, ICE is asking us to provide them with proof of where they're going to live, who's going to provide for them, um, and how they're going to be able to support themselves so that they don't end up becoming like, you know, living, becoming homeless essentially. Um, so we've had incredible support um, through local community organizations, specifically the OC Friends of Detainees. It's a volunteer group that was created under with the Uni Unitarian Universalists. And these individuals have both put money to raise bond funds to get people released from detention, as well as um, opened up their homes to, to take these individuals in. Even if it is just temporary, ICE doesn't expect them to live with individuals forever. Um, it's really just ICE needs to know where they're going to be in the immediate future and, and will release them. So if anyone here is interested in that cause, please follow up with me or please follow up with the individual who asked the question. We'd love to provide you with more information about that. Yeah, we're really running out of time, so I'm going to be really quick. And I just wanted to um, respond to your question about violence against transgender women of color. You know, I came out as a transgender man like 21 years ago, and the, one of the biggest issues back then was violence against transgender people, particularly women, particularly women of color. I feel like we've made very little progress on that in 20 years, and it's just it's completely unacceptable. But I finally, I feel like for the first time that in my experience, we were finally starting to understand that we can look, we will never solve that issue if we're looking at it only through a transgender lens. That is never going to take us to the solution because the, that just takes you to things like, well, let's get hate crime laws and prosecution, and that really doesn't address the problem. But to me, the most encouraging things are looking at it, people starting to look at it now as gender based violence and understanding a lot of violence comes from intimate partners, which that helps you figure out what policy solutions to make. A lot of it, Andrea Ritchie just wrote a great book called Invisible No More about police profiling and brutality against women of color, but she includes transgender women in that, and if we, you know, there's a lot of attention to Eric Garner and Michael Brown, and men of color are targeted by police, well, that happens to women of color too, so that is a really important part of this problem, is just police profiling of all women of color and transgender women of color get caught up in that, and then transgender women get pushed into sex work. I mean, the D.C. Trans Coalition just did an amazing analysis of the way D.C police did this initiative crackdown on prostitution in D.C., and it drove all of these transgender women into, who had been working in, in relatively out of hotels or on the Internet, drove them into very unsafe streets, and it increased the murder rate. There was a direct correlation between criminalizing sex work and violence against transgender women, particularly women of color. But if we can find, I feel like we're finally starting to understand what's underneath these problems and looking at it through a wider lens that gives us stuff. I, have, I feel hope for the first time in decades that we might actually be on the verge of figuring out some ways to really do something about that problem. I hope so. I'll be quick because I agree with everything Shannon just said. And the way, in particular, the way I was going to answer that question, the way we're, we're focusing 
on using ACLU resources to, to tackle that problem is exactly the approach you're talking about. Two areas. One is we've waited. We, the ACLU has actually opposed the criminalization of sex work for decades, but um, just this year um, in our California affiliate, we voted a lot more time and attention to we actually um, this case pending in the Ninth Circuit. Um, that, that is a challenge to, to the sex work law. And um, we, um, along with many uh, groups in California, we wrote an amicus brief that was joined by many groups, um, specifically highlighting for the court the disproportionate enforcement and impact and profiling um, that's had on uh, transgender women, um, LGBTQ men, homeless youth, um, and cisgender women um, generally, as opposed to sort of, you know, sort of the, the uh, customer uh, versus the, the seller. Um, issue. Um, so I think, you know, we have to tackle sex work criminalization, period, and the disproportionate ways that those laws are enforced. Um, and also all of our work on um, combating profiling. Um, that, that is, that's, I think, the, the two nubs, um, ways that I think we can just try to keep people out of the system. Um, I'm obviously speaking only to kind of state, state violence at the moment. There's obviously lots of other issues, but I'm sensitive that we're out of time. But happy to talk about it more as well. I'd like to Thank all of our panelists for an inspiring and um, informative first session. So we are having a break, but we're going to ask you to keep it to 10 minutes so we can start at 2.40 so that we don't fall too much behind. Thank you.
I want to play. Oh, okay. I was just saying, I was Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from our short break. We will have another short break before the next uh, phase of the annual update. My name is David Cruz. I am a visiting scholar at the E. Williams Institute this spring from my home base at the USC Gould School of Law and a longtime member of the faculty advisory committee of the Williams Institute. Um, I spoke at the first annual update and now here at the 16th annual update. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator of our next panel, um, Kareth J. Conran, who is the Blatchford Cooper Distinguished Scholar and Research Director at the Williams Institute. Dr. Conran's scholarship has focused on documenting and reducing health inequities that affect LGBT people, including, um, excuse me, designing and testing measures used on several large scale or large population based surveys. Her um, experience includes serving on the uh, smart and genius working groups about which you will hear more. And she will this afternoon be serving as moderator on this panel on gender identity data collection. Thank you, David. Thank you all for joining us today. You will hear from four incredible scholars about how to collect data, new findings from CHIS and USTF, and how to apply data in the legal arena. Following their presentations, we'll have a few um, questions, but we're gonna need to keep, uh, make up a little bit of time and get ready for our moot court. Okay. There are hundreds of sources of information about the U.S. population that are used to inform resource allocations as well as to monitor the impact of public policy. These include Census Bureau surveys, Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys, DOJ and Uniform Crime Reporting System surveys, health surveys, electronic health records, hospital records, infectious disease reports, cancer registries, and mortality statistics. Six of these federal surveys were systems sources of information collect data about transgender people that, and their needs. However, the first survey that included a question that would allow us to identify transgender people was in 2007, which meant that the needs of transgender people were invisible to most state and federal institutions for a very, very long time. Now, did we know nothing? Of course not. And here's how it all began. In the mid to late 1990s, trans people partnered with city health departments around the country to conduct HIV needs assessments. Their questions about assigned sex at birth and gender identity inform how we collect data today. In 2008, the National Center for Trans Equality with NGLTF and UP pioneered the National, trans trans National Transgender Discrimination Survey. In 2009, the Williams Institute published a best practices report on sexual orientation data measurement with a chapter that talked about the importance of gender data collection. In 2011, NTDS findings were published in the Landmark Injustice at Every Turn report. In 2015, NCTE launched its second major survey, the U.S. Transgender Survey, USPS. Also that year, thanks to many of you, sex and gender questions were added in CHIP. In 2016, one of the first federal surveys, the National Crime Victimization Surveys, finally added questions about the science of birth and gender identity. We look forward to analyzing those data. And in 2016, TransPOP was launched. In parallel and working within government, several of us included questions about transgender status on many population-based surveys. However, these data were not published and accessible to the public until 2011. 2014, the Williams Institute published another best practices report, this time focused on gender identity measurements and led by Jody Herman here from Williams Institute. And thanks to our prior advocacy with FEDS, we were able to include a question about transgender status 
as an optional module in the Federal Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which we lovingly refer to as ARFIS. So, we began to make major strides at this point in time, and what we're looking at here are the number of public health grants that were, have been funded over time that focus on transgender or transsexual populations. And I use the term transsexual because a lot of the early work around HIV AIDS was, would have used that term in, in their grant proposals. Of course, absolutely. Um, it was a little later that we started using transgender as an umbrella term, but you're absolutely right. So what this slide shows is that federal dollars can be leveraged as data amassed. And so the early work on the needs assessment studies and then NTDS were cited in an important IOM report in 2011. And after this happened and there were um, funding announcements available through NIH, we see a flourishment of studies that focus on transgender health. Now, why do we care about health in a, in a school of law or in a legal or policy arena? It's because most of what we know about transgender people has been funded by public health streams and are related to questions that have been included on public health surveys. So, what are the concepts and questions that we need to think about for today? The first is sex, which we think of as a biological characteristic. Here's a question that was developed by NCTE um, many, many years ago and has been included on many questions since. Gender identity is a psychological and social characteristic. And gender expression refers to the outward expression of gender identity, which may be perceived by others as falling along a continuum of masculinity and, and femininity. These questions are then used to characterize people based on two question combinations, where a cisgender person may be defined as a person whose current gender identity is fully aligned with their assigned sex at birth, and a transgender person is a person whose gender identity is not fully aligned with their sex at birth. And here's how it would look. A person who's assigned sex at birth is male, whose current gender identity is also male, would be classified as cisgender. The same is true for women. And everybody else would be classified as transgender. If you're a person who likes to put people in boxes like I do, so that you can count them. <laughs> so gender, gender expression is a continuous phenomenon there are no gold standards about where to create cut points in order to categorize people, and here is just one example. A person who's assigned sex at birth is male, whose gender expression is perceived as somewhat too very masculine, could be classified as gender conforming in his expression. And the same is true for women, using femininity um, as the cross-classification variable. And everyone else we could classify as gender non-conforming. Now is the butterfly mosaic the national um, symbol of gender nonconformity, not yet, but feel free to adopt it as you move forward in the world. So some of you may have noticed that the public policy landscape has been a bit tumultuous lately. And while t-shirts can't hurt with messages of love, we have found that numbers can be pretty useful in the policy arena. We have found that numbers from NTDS, from BARFIS, and more recently from USTS, have helped us come up with estimates of trans youth and adults, which positions us to comment on the potential impact of proposed legislation on the transgender community. It's allowed us to, to comment on many bits of proposed legislation, to file many briefs. Over the last year, we've been able to use numbers from NTDS and BARFIS to inform several reports. Not only do we use population demography from these sources, information about socioeconomic status, health, um, and from other sources, um, experiences of discrimination. All of these reports can be accessed through our website. And again, with these numbers, we are able to comment on the potential impact of many policies on our diverse community across a range of issues. So without further ado, I'm going to announce our first panelist, Dr. Jody Herman who holds a PhD in public policy. She is a scholar of policy at the Williams Institute. She leads our transgender um, demography and health research. She was a co-author of Injustice at Every Turn and a co-PI of USTF. Thank you. Great. Okay, so as uh, Karis mentioned, um, there are many different ways to collect and use data. Um, where the federal government is falling short on this effort, um, which I think we would all agree, 
um, individual states, organizations, and academics have uh, attempted to fill in some of the gaps in um, the data about transgender people. Um, so, for instance, Bianca is going to talk about advancements we've made here in, in California, with the California Health Interview Survey. Um, Sandy's going to talk a little bit about advancements made by the National Center for Transgender Equality through the U.S. Trans Survey. Um, but today I'm going to talk about a unique methodology developed um, between the Williams Institute with Alon Meyer as principal investigator and the Gallup organization. Um, and I'm a co-investigator along with Walter Boxing and Sari Reisner on this project. And oops, Alon is, is listed twice there. Sorry about that. But that's just indicative about how important he is. Um, <laughs> he's very important. Um, so I think this uh, methodology that I'll describe for you shows um, a new way forward in terms of data collection about transgender populations. Um, so this is the TransPOP study page, which you can find online. Um, and we have received uh, two years of funding from NICHD, which is the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And so we are about to embark on um, our new wave of data collection. Um, let's see. So the TransPOP uh, project is aided by the uh, a scientific advisory board. Um, and which is comprised of individual experts that bring a variety of perspectives and expertise to the table um, to inform our efforts, including Mark Kiesling, who's the executive director of, of NCTE. So here's a basic outline of the methodology. There are two major steps. So first, we utilize a large national probability sample, which means that it will be nationally representative. Um, and we use that sample to identify uh, trained respondents and then recruit them into our study. So this means we would identify a nationally representative sample of gender individuals, which is incredibly rare. Um, second, we uh, administer an original survey uh, with those trans respondents that we've identified, um, if they consent to participate in the survey, of course. Um, and the survey is to ask questions about demographics, about health, um, and about various experiences, including experiences of discrimination. Um, so for our large probability sample that we are going to kind of be piggybacking on, um, we are utilizing the Gallup Daily Tracking Poll. So the Gallup Daily Tracking Poll is very large. Um, there's a sample of about 1,000 individuals. Uh, per day, which means about 350,000 individuals are surveyed every year. Um, and the trans population is relatively small, um, but when we're able to screen this many people, uh, it actually allows us to identify a, a good sized sample of, of trans people. So the daily tracking poll asks the following question of all respondents, um, which I lovingly call question D63. Um, it says, I have. <laughs> I have one final question we are asking only for statistical purposes, um, which is a caveat that they deemed necessary. Um, do you personally identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender? Uh, yes or no? So um, in our first wave of the study, we are able to use this question to identify an LGBT sample, which is anyone who says yes. Um, and then ask a follow-up question to see whether they are transgender. Uh, if they are transgender, then they would be eligible for our trans pop study. And concurrently, uh, people who are not transgender but are LGB, um, L cisgender LGB, um, are enrolled in a different study called Generation. And um, Bianca is actually a part of that project. So if you want to learn more about the LGB study, I'm sure she would be happy to tell you about that uh, afterward if you're interested. Um, so. Using that question D63, we were concerned that there may be some misclassification of trans people, um, either by missing people who said no but actually are trans, or um, those who said yes who actually are not trans. Um, so these are called false positives and false negatives. So a false positive could be somebody who's not LGBT but said yes to D63, um, perhaps because they identify with the LGBT community in some way, but are personally LGBT themselves. Um, or a false negative could be somebody who is LGBT, um, but said no to D63, perhaps because of 
stigma or because they don't necessarily identify with those words. Um, so this was something that we were concerned about and wanted to investigate. So we conducted a sensitivity study to see if we were actually capturing the people that we wanted to be capturing through the D63 question. Um, and we further had the opportunity to test two different versions of a two-step identity question, which Kareth kind of described. You asked about sex assigned at birth and then asked about current gender identity. Um, so we were able uh, to test two versions of those questions with a full Gallup sample to see how they perform, or, or with a sample of the full Gallup sample. Lots of samples and samples. That gets confusing. Um, anyway, <laughs> the sensitivity of the study uh, was conducted in March of 2016, and the two-step test was conducted in July and August of, of last year, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Um, so here's a graphic representation of the sensitivity study. We start at the green square, um, which is the LGBT question, D33, and ask additional questions of respondents who either said yes or no to the question. Um, the no group um, was a smaller random sample of 8,000 individuals because pretty much everyone was no. Um, so through the additional questions, we can surmise that there are false positives among those who said yes, they're LGBT, and we or uh, did we miss some LGBT people who said no uh, to the question, and those would be false negatives. So those are those red squares, too. So we wanted to just make sure that we are properly, properly categorizing people through this question. Um, so what we found, though, is that uh, through this sensitivity study was that the LGBT question D63 does not capture trans people who identify as gay. Um, and so this is a huge problem because in the sensitivity study found that out of all those people, 66% said that they were straight. And so that means actually we're missing 66% of the trans population through that question. Um, so that's a big problem. Um, and, and so we needed to address that, and the way to address that was not to rely on the D63 question at all uh, to enroll our sample. Okay. Um, so as our study moves forward, we will be asking all Gallup respondents a two-step gender identity question in order to identify trans respondents for our study. Um, but we had a couple versions of the two-step that we were considering. Um, so we conducted the test to see which would perform better. So this first version, or what we call the quote-unquote old version, uh, has a sex assignment at birth and a gender identity question. But the second question uh, has a more expanded list of options. Um, woman, man, trans woman, trans man, and non-binary or genderqueer. Um, but the new version uh, is something that is, was informed by some of the testing work that was conducted with the California Health Interview Survey, which Bianca is going to talk a little bit more about. Um, it has a slightly different wording for the first question, which is better for an um, interview-administered survey. People were kind of guessing at what they were supposed to be answering uh, in the other version. Uh, and it has a more streamlined second question which a, with a follow-up for those who said that they are transgender in the second question. I, we can talk about that a little bit more afterwards, but that was the way that it was initially designed. Okay. So, um, so the new version uh, has this type of structure, and we tested it against the old version. So uh, in terms of the population that both uh, versions were able to identify, the old version uh, seemed to have a higher point estimate uh, for the percentage of those who are transgender. But when you look at the uh, confidence intervals, those are the ranges that are in parentheses there, um, there actually is no statistically significant difference in the population uh, that was identified by both of those versions. Um, but I will note that the new version does identify a significantly smaller proportion of people who are genderqueer and non-binary. Um, but where the new version really outperforms the old version is regard to those who refuse um, to answer the question for whichever reason. So um, the old version has a substantially higher uh, percentage of people who refuse to answer the questions. And so for that reason, we've selected the, um, we've selected the a new version for the next wave of the TransPOP study, which will be continuing over the next two years. 
So uh, just to conclude, um, we have a, a two-stage sampling procedure that we're using with GAL, and, and we have found that it's feasible, and so we can utilize and piggyback on these large national um, surveys. It's a potential way to add more data collection for trans people uh, and create nationally representative samples. Um, we, uh, you should always proceed with a clear definition of the populations that you are interested in. This is something that was challenging for us in TransPOP. Um, but it also speaks to the need to invest in all forms of studies because each has its pros and cons and each has its limitations in the uh, actual population that they're identifying. So uh, with that, I believe Bianca is next. Um, thank you. This will work. Uh, I think this will work. Okay. Um, Thank you, Jody. Jody uh, and many others uh, sweat the details so the rest of you don't have to. Um, data collection measurement um, is a really important process when you have a very small minority population. And so um, this, this work on TransPOP um, has really helped us move the field forward. So thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Bianca Wilson. She is a senior scholar at the Williams Institute. She's a community psychologist who has been leading our work around youth um, Used particularly in the foster care system um, and the juvenile justice system, and we are uh, very fortunate to have her with us today. Thanks. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, in the interest of making up time, I'm, you'll see that there are some slides I might just give like a brief one-liner to um, and try to get right to the data. So I'll, I'll continue the the nerd panel. With, with, with data, um, but we'll try to skip some of the more processy parts. Um, I don't work alone, that's the point here. Um, so, <clears throat> moving on. So what I wanted to present to you today, I'm really excited to be here to talk about some of the preliminary findings from the California Health Interview Survey in terms of its 2015 data collection, which included measures of gender identity for adults and gender expression for adolescents. Um, the, the research comes out of, at this point now, a multi-year collaboration between um, the Williams Institute and the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, which um, leads and directs the, the CHIS. Um, am I speaking loud, loud enough? Okay. okay. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we started this collaboration years ago acknowledging, look, CHIS is, um, you know, one of the largest resources of statewide um, health care access and health um, data. Uh, it has served as a resource for sexual orientation data, but there's a major gap with regard to um, gender minority populations. And so within that, I'm talking about both those who identify as trans, gender queer, as well as um, gender nonconforming folks, so kind of everyone fitting under um, a gender minority category. Um, so with that acknowledgement, a lot of work went into um, raising funding and uh, on the administrative end, um, thanks to Brad Sears working with a lot of folks, um, and then Jody and I and Gary Gates working on the scientific end to get those items in. Um, the bottom line here is we did an experiment. We knew there were many different ways the questions could be asked. We wanted to find the best one. <clears throat> uh, the takeaway of those experiments was simply that um, asking gender identity is not a big deal. People didn't hang up the phone and run screaming. Um, so it's totally possible. And we did arrive at, you know, we knew that there were a lot of different ways you could ask the question. All of these perform relatively well in different parts of the country. Um, we want to know what was the best way to do it through this administration mode, meaning a telephone interview survey, which is how CHID is conducted, um, in California. And we arrived at the two-step measure which has been described in various ways so far already between um, Kareth and Jody. So, jump to um, 2015 data collection and, and we found. So, um, in 2015, and, and this is the, you know, the going to your cycles, Chiz, so I'm, you know, providing a preliminary sneak preview of half of that full cycle by talking about the one year. In that one year, 21,000 adults approximately were interviewed and over 700 um, teens. When we talk about the question that was used for adults with regard to gender identity, um, you know, and, and the age range here being adults up to the age of 70, 
uh, this two-step measure asking first, what sex were you assigned at birth? That is on your original birth certificate, male or female. And then how do you currently describe yourself, male, female, transgender, or I do not identify as any of these. So these are the items that we use um, to identify trans participants. Trans participants then being those who either chose transgender identity as their current gender identity, or for those um, who said that their current gender identity was not the same as their sex assigned at birth. When looking at teens and adolescents, we were also able to um, get a measure of gender expression in um, to look at the experiences of gender non-conforming youth. Here, gender expression was measured with the school context being the main kind of anchor, um, asking youth, you know, tell us about how folks would describe you in terms of appearance and mannerisms um, along a range of masculinity to femininity. Um, and here, gender nonconforming youth then being categorized as those who chose um, either an androgynous, meaning the equally masculine or feminine, or anything in the gender expression that would be assumed to not match with their um, current gender. That is, young folks who said identify as male and chose any level of femininity, we, for, for the purposes of this analysis, categorize as gender nonconforming. Okay, so what do we find? Um, with regard to transgender adults, um, just a little bit about who, you know, who's in the sample. Um, we saw that approximately 0.25% of the sample identified as trans or were categorized as transgender. This translates approximately 64,000 adults in the state of California um, being transgender. Average age, approximately 35 years, but I will note that we have a really large um, kind of spread, which you see in that standard error, uh, give or take five years. And that's important because I, I think like many other samples, we actually see that here they tend to be a little bit younger and the age range a little bit more spread out than the non-trans folks. In terms of ethnic distribution, um, not surprisingly for California, the majority um, being either Hispanic um, or, or white identified. A little bit more um, in terms of uh, who was uh, who was responding. When thinking about this relationship between transgender status and um, sex assigned at birth, we see that um, the majority in this sample who identified as trans or were categorized as trans um, were assigned female at birth, about two thirds. In terms of sexual orientation, and this is you know really important, and you know just remembering both the relationship and the distinctions between sexual orientation and gender identity, that they're not one and the same. And um, in terms of sexual orientation, we saw a real uh, diversity there uh, among the transgender participants with about equal percent being either straight or gay, lesbian identified, followed by bisexual, um, not sexual, or other, choosing other. So, you know, the real um, folks of the California Health Review Survey is to understand how Californians um, are fearing with regard to health status and health access, um, with a real emphasis on insurance status, experience discrimination in the healthcare setting, um, and then a number of health indicators. So, you know, to, to start um, examining the experiences of transgender adults in terms of health and healthcare access, we tested for differences between trans, non trans folks in terms of several of these topics, specifically insurance rates, unfair medical treatment and health, and then suicidality, given that it's significant um, within our culture and within the literature. Um, so to jump to it, we see that trans folks show statistically significant differences on several of these variables. And I'll point out that, you know, and so the stars indicate where those bars are considered statistically significant difference, but I've still presented all the variables regardless of whether or not they were statistically significant. Um, but the ones that were, you know, statistically different really fall into this, um, you know, kind of bucket of indicators of mental health and psychological well-being. Um, even the measure of fair or poor health, that measure asks, you know, in general, do you, how do you rate your health from poor, fair, good, or excellent, which is, ends up being really a mix of both physical and, and mental health. So um, both not... Uh, Surprising given what we've seen in the, in, in the research, and yet, um, you know, I'd argue important to still document. So quickly to move on to the teen data. 
Um, so this is very exciting to have statewide data on gender expression. And gender expression in particular because we, we know in the research that um, gender expression regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity is a significant factor impacting how youth are treated by their peers and by other adults. So including gender expression was seen as very important. So using the way that we categorize gender nonconforming youth, 24% um, of the sample were categorized as gender nonconforming. Um, here's the average age, ethnic distribution, quite similar given, and not surprising, given that this is California. That 24% translates to approximately 850,000 youth in the state of California. And a little bit more um, here again, we see that females um, were much more likely to identify as gender nonconforming than males. Um, and in my experience with gender expression measurement, that's especially not rising. Looking at health disparities and what was measured among teens, we looked at several variables in the school context. I still present them here, but none of these are statistically significant. But nonetheless, I think important areas and something we can, we can talk about more if folks are interested. I did get the warning, so I'm pushing along quickly. <laughs> Um, and then finally, the, the last set of variables that we looked at with regard to teens and gender expression, again, the um, kind of indicators related to mental health, we see, again, really high rates um, and significantly differently high rates of suicidal thought and suicide attempts. So what next? Um, I'll skip through some of this. I mean, I just want to point out, again, that you know, the results affirm what we already know and really upsetting figures about what we see in other community and large scale survey samples with regard to suicidality and mental health. Um, but what they add is the needed addition of more research that's at a state level and using a probability sample. Um, and I think particularly when looking at the youth data that this is not retrospective, that it's an opportunity to understand the experiences of queer folks um, during childhood while they're actually still children and, and, and teenagers, and that's important. Um, next steps are to combine it with the 2016 data, which will up our sample size and hopefully help to um, look at more of those differences. And then I'd add just the need to, well, we'll look more at some indicators of resiliency and not just all of the kind of mental illness and mental distress variables. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Sandy James, um, who is from uh, National Center for Trans Equality. He is a JD who is also working on his PhD in American government. He did extensive analyses of NTDS, was the survey manager for USTS, and also the lead author on the recent USTS report. Thank you, Sandy. have here a copy of the full report. This is my personal copy that I carry around like it's my child because it feels really like it is. Um, but I did bring with me some copies of the executive summaries. Some of them are outside. Some of them are at the front. I encourage you to grab one of those. This is also available online, the full report and the executive summary. But again, I'm going through this 240-page report in about 15 slides. So I'm going to skip over a few things. So I'm still going to spend almost no time talking about methodology. We've heard a lot about different types of methodology here, but I'm here to present results. Um, there's an extensive methodology chapter, and then there's also an extensive methodology appendix. There's lots to read about it, and you don't need to hear it all from me. So, but I did want to say this. The U.S. Transgender Service uh, Survey, which is the U.S. scale or USPIS, uh, was conducted in the summer of 2015, and it was conducted over a period of 34 days. And I'm saying that because then it makes the, um, the sample size that much more unbelievable. Um, and this is a follow-up to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, which um, has been mentioned here a few times. Um, that's something that uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality did back in 08, 09, and that had yielded the probably the largest sample of, of trans people that we had at the time. 
of uh, over 6,400 respondents. But what we wanted to do with this new survey was to get some updated data. 2008, 2009 was quite some time ago, and we wanted to see what was going on now. We wanted to really be able to get into a wider range of topics and really take a deeper dive into those topics. We wanted to address some data collection gaps. I think this, that's what a lot of this panel is actually about, and I think people might, might speak to it a little bit later. Um, the reason why a place like National Center for Transgender Equality is doing a, a research study of this kind is because of the major research gaps in data collection around um, gender identity. And we also wanted to be able to have some comparability to existing and future surveys, meaning we wanted to be able to pull in some federal, uh, questions from federal surveys so we could do some exact um, comparisons. And lastly, we wanted to be able to increase the number of respondents that we had in our sample. So that being said, we, we had hoped we'd get about 10,000 respondents. We got almost 28,000 respondents in that 34-day period. Um, what tells me is a few things is that, that people were really hungry to be able to, to fill out this 300-plus um, potentially uh, question survey. It was a, a long process for many people, um, you know, hours for some, a few minutes for others. But it, it told me that people were really hungry to be, be able to um, have their voices heard. We, we had respondents from all 50 states, District of Columbia, and several U.S. territories. It was an um, adult-only survey, and I'm happy to speak to why it was an adult-only survey and a little later on, but suffice it to say that there are a lot of restrictions around being able to survey minors, and so we uh, restricted it to adults-only. It was available in English and Spanish online only, and one of the big findings, uh, you know, or I'm not sure it's really a big finding as much as it's something that we were able to finally document is that a third of our sample identified as non-binary. I think that has a lot of implications for how people are doing work going forward, uh, particularly at the National Center for Trans Equality and, and, and other uh, places. So we've heard a lot about population-based studies and, and piggybacking here and doing this and all kinds of, uh, I think the word was nerdy, um, things that have been said about it. This is not a population-based survey. This is a survey. This is a, a convenient sample. It actually wasn't that convenient. I don't know why we call it that. But it was um, where you go out and you, you ask people, hey, do you identify as trans? Please, please take the survey. And again, we can go into, you know, this report goes into our outreach methods. It goes into how we did this and how we got our respondents. But I think this is something that is really important for people to look at. If you look at this side by side, these two maps, on the left, we have um, USDS respondents. There's all 27,715 people plotted on a map. And then we have the distribution of the population of the United States. They look strikingly similar. So what that tells me is, it, it, this is not about patting myself on the back, hey, we got to everyone. What, it is a, what we're able to say by looking at this is, is that, first of all, trans people are everywhere. We know that, but it's nice to be able to say, look at this distribution. Um, we can actually talk, to, uh, talk about some of those issues that people bring up when they say, oh, it's not population-based. This distribution says a lot about who we were able to get to and, and where people are actually in, in the United States. And those dark spots, um, that, that is a density um, reflection. So larger cities have more people in it. That's why they have a bigger, darker spot. And that's what we saw in our samples. So we weren't just sampling people from the big cities on the both coasts, which is another thing that people like to to claim that trans people are just in the big liberals, you know, strongholds on the East and the West Coast. So um, no member of Congress should be able to claim that they don't have trans people in their constituency. And I, and I want you all to be able to refer back to this, uh, this figure, uh, figure 4.19, if you want to write it down, in, in the report. So there were several things we saw, um, several overarching themes that we were able to see in, in, in our study. And one of them was that there was pervasive mistreatment and violence throughout severe economic hardship and instability, harmful effects on physical and mental health, and these were all compounded by other forms of discrimination. So in terms of pervasive treatment and, and violence, almost half of our samples said that they have been verbally harassed in the past year because they were trans, and almost one in 10 said they had been physically attacked in the past year because they were trans. Um, the numbers of sexual assault that were, respond, uh, were reported uh, were, were just staggering. Almost half of our sample had been sexually assaulted at some point in their lifetime, and one in 10 had been sexually assaulted in the past year. In terms of severe economic 
parchment stability. This is one of the places um, in which we were able to uh, do a direct comparison um, due to a very labor-intensive process and a lot of fighting uh, with Jody Herman as to which questions we would actually include in so that we could get precise measures that the um, Census Bureau uses, um, I can't even remember, Bureau of Labor Statistics uses to be able to uh, come up with numbers like the unemployment rate and the poverty rate. So in terms of that, our sample had an employment rate that was three times higher than that in the U.S. population at the time of our survey. And it was twice as high uh, in terms of rate of poverty, 29% versus 14% in our sample. Our sample said that, almost a third of our sample said that they had been homeless at some point in their lifetime, experienced homelessness. And 12% said they had experienced homelessness within the past year. I'm just touching briefly on, on um, health findings, um, mostly because Bianca spoke a lot about health findings, and a lot of the things we see are, are very similar in our survey in terms of trends and disparity. But I did want to point this thing out here. In the past year, uh, among those who had seen a health care provider, a third of our respondents said that they had been harassed or turned away or had some other type of negative experience because they were trans. Almost a quarter of our sample did not seek health care for fear of being mistreated, and a third did not seek health care because they could not afford it. And I mentioned uh, that there were compounding uh, effects of, of other forms of discrimination, and we saw this throughout, everywhere in our sample. So among people of color, for example, poverty was three times higher uh, than the U.S. population, and I mentioned earlier it was two times higher in the sample overall. But I think one of the most staggering findings we had, um, and they were all, they were all pretty um, unbelievable, but also believable based on all the anecdotal evidence we have. So 1.4% of our respondents had, were living with HIV. It was five times higher than the U.S. population at the time, um, which uh, I think we, we reported was about 0.3%. But when you looked at the rate amongst uh, people of color, and particularly women of color, these rates were just astronomical. Among black trans women, the rate was 19%. Among American Indian women in our sample, it was 4.6%. And among trans Latinas, it was 4.4%. These numbers are just staggering and un unbelievable. And also, we saw these same kind of things with, among people with disabilities and um, our undocumented respondents um, in terms of uh, compounding effects. Of, of, of these other forms of discrimination. So we were able to look at people's experiences in school, and um, this, is, uh, this has become a very um, important topic lately, of course, with all of the, what actually I refer to as a lot of noise that's out there about what's going on in trans communities and among trans students. This is really important information. The 77% of those who were out or perceived as trans in K through 12 said they had experienced some form of mistreatment. That includes these forms of mistreatment, 54% saying they have been verbally harassed, 24% who have been physically attacked, 13% who have been sexually assaulted, and 17% who had said they have school because the, the treatment was so bad. But this also includes things such as not being able to dress in, in the manner in which uh, best reflects your, your gender identity and gender expression, of 52% of those people, and receiving discipline from fighting back up against bullies, that was 36%. There's just a lot of these patterns that are, that are showing up in schools. And this didn't really seem to get that much better when you looked in institutions of higher learning, which you might expect um, that, you know, everybody is much more enlightened when you get to an institution of higher learning. But almost a quarter of those who out of perceived as trans in an uh, institution of higher education had said they were very physically or sexually harassed. Okay. Sorry, I'm speaking so fast and there's just so many numbers. I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to push through this. So in terms of employment in the workplace, um, our school, because with, simply because they were trans, 16% of those who have been employed in the past year said they had lost a job. Almost a third of those who had jobs in the last year had been fired, denied a promotion, or faced some other form of mistreatment. That includes 15% that had been verbally harassed, physically attacked, or sexually assaulted on the job in the past year. 
terms of housing stability, we saw, again, we saw patterns of um, just um, major instability. In the past year, 23% in our sample said they had faced housing discrimination or some form of instability. More than a quarter of those who had experienced homelessness or shelters for fear of mistreatment, and those who did access shelters reported mistreatment in, in just staggering numbers, 70% that they had experienced some form of mistreatment because they were trans in a shelter. This kind of discrimination we also saw in places of public accommodation. Now, there were many, many more um, areas of public accommodation that we asked about in our survey, but these are ones that I just wanted to highlight here. About a third of our samples said that they had been denied equal treatment or service, verbally harassed or physically attacked in a place of public accommodation. Now, these were those who visited a particular place uh, where staff or, or employees knew um, or perceived them to be trans. That includes 34%. 34% said that they had, been, they had experienced some form of mistreatment in public transportation. 22% in a DV shelter. 22% in a substance treatment program. Now, I'm speaking to those things because we, we, talk, we talk all the time, no, where of vulnerabilities in these different communities, but when people are actually trying to seek care and they're trying to seek help, um, they're, they're running into more and more issues. Um, and, you know, we're compounding discrimination everywhere people are turning. I wanted to mention a few more things. Uh, we, we spoke a lot about, we asked a lot about family life um, and can't really sum it up much in this in the one slide, but I want to say that of those who were out to their immediate family, 10% said they had a family member who was violent towards them, 8% had been kicked out, and 10% had run away from home because they were trans. But I think in terms of family, uh, one of the most important findings I think that we can uh, is reflected in, 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 in this, particular, um, this particular graphic. This looks at the impact of family support. So I have treasures there. I have people who experience homelessness, attempted suicide, and who are currently experiencing serious psychological distress. And the dark blue line represents those who had supportive families. And the light blue line represents those who did not have supportive families. Now, even if you can't see exactly what all of that says, and actually that, that turns out very well. Um, it's blown up really nicely. So... Um, I think you can see that it doesn't completely eradicate the problem, but it has an unbelievable effect um, on being able to re reduce the prevalence of, of these three measures. And that sort of thing was seen across the board also in terms of support mechanisms. Now, I did not think I could get away with not saying something about restrooms, although I almost always put this at the very end of my presentation, and I minimize it. I minimize it because it has been so, um, I, I can't even think of a good word for it. There has been so much talk about bathroom access, and I think the conversation in the past year or so has just been reduced to the bathrooms and locker rooms, and everyone who's in this room, everyone who's on this panel knows that that is this much of the story. I've, I've pointed to so many other things that is part of the story, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't speak to experiences in restrooms. Now, keeping in, keep in mind that we asked about this, uh, we had a survey in August through September 2015. So this is well before um, what I'd say was, I don't want to call it a debacle, but HB2 and everything that has come since that, since people have really been put on blast and trans people have really been heavily scrutinized about the way they are accessing a very basic facility and a basic need in the past year. But even prior to that time, our sample said that they were experiencing these problems. Almost one in 10 said that they had been denied access to a restroom. 59% of our sample said they avoided using public restrooms for fear of confrontation. And almost a third said they limited the amount they ate or drank to avoid using a restroom. Now, I want to be clear about this because I've, I, I've gotten pushback from a number of people. I, I, I do these sorts of presentations and people ask me, like, well, what about this? How can you compare it to what else is going on in, in the U.S. around bathrooms? And I just want 
I, I want to give two, a couple of takeaway points on that. There is some research about people's experiences in bathrooms out there. There's a phenomenon, for example, called pee shyness that has been studied quite a bit where people go to the bathroom and they, they can't go. They're actually too shy to pee. Um, and that is a phenomenon that actually affects males more than it affects females. It is fascinating, but that's not what we asked about here. There, is, there are also studies that look at um, people who, who have phobias around bathroom access. Public restrooms are pretty just gross. You know, they're, they're not places we all want to go. It would be great if we could just go at home, but we all access these facilities. Again, that's not what we were talking about here. We asked people in our study, in the context of being a trans person, in the context of accessing the restroom as a trans person, what were your experiences? And we come away with 59% who are avoiding using restrooms. I am one of those people. I hate using public restrooms. And I almost always use the family restroom. I feel like a jerk because I do it, but I almost always use the family restroom. Any gender neutral restroom is better than having to put myself in harm's way in any kind of way. Um, and then 32% limited the amount they ate or drank. That is not something that, that we should all be okay with. So if people with this narrative around ref, restroom access and safety start reconfiguring this argument a little bit so that we talk about safety. I think safety is being able to hydrate properly throughout the day and eat, you know, what everybody else gets to eat throughout the day. Um, and I think it's also being able to use the restroom when you need to. Um, we, we also looked into um, people who reported that they had had some kind of urinary tract or kidney infection. Can I, I turn you to the full report? Please read it in your spare time. It's a page turner, but not for the reasons you would hope. Um, or at the very least, please try to um, take a copy of the executive summary um, and learn more about what we were able to find so that when people are asking you or you're engaging in conversations about what's going on in trans communities, then you can also be knowledgeable and throw out some stats here and there. Thank you. Sandy, thank you for sharing that important resource with everyone here today. And now I'm pleased to introduce um, my dear colleague, Adam Romero, who is the Director of Legal Scholarship and Federal Policy at the Williams Institute. Um, he also has the um, uh, status of having successfully represented plaintiffs in Cooper Harris versus USA, which um, argued that same-sex uh, married people have the same rights to veterans' benefits as people in opposite-sex marriages. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And, and it's my task now to take all of uh, that we just heard, all of this data, and, and try to explain to you some of the policy and law impacts that it has. Of course, it's central to the mission of the Williams Institute to do research that has real world relevance and uh, that does inform and impact uh, the law and policy of the United States and abroad. And I just, in, in many ways, the first panel that we already heard made my job much easier because as they were speaking for, for everyone who was here and for those who were, and it was a, a discussion of the law and policy developments that we're seeing um, right now under the Trump administration. And as everyone was speaking, I kept thinking, gosh, all of that data that we're going to hear about in the next panel or the research that's been done by the Williams Institute and many other researchers across the country is relevant and is informing all of uh, the discussion that happened in the first panel. And in fact, if uh, the New York Times recently um, we're put on a study by Jody and Bianca and um, our colleague Andrew Flores and others that they didn't talk about today, but I do want to highlight very quickly, which is um, estimates on the number of trans people in the country. And in one study, they found that there were a, uh, an estimated 1.5 million trans adults in this country all across the United States. And then in a second study uh, that uh, our, uh, Dr. Conrad uh, joined, found that there were approximately 150,000 transgender youth. And so the New York Times, in the context of the GG case that uh, we heard about in the first panel, and I'll talk a little bit more in a second, um, published this uh, fantastic news story. And 
but you, you can read it for yourself, but I'll read it too. It says, the, the, the figure on the number of trans people stands to inform the fierce debate over the rights of transgender youth, reignited on Wednesday by President, uh, President Trump's decision to rescind an Obama administration policy that protected the rights of students to use bathrooms corresponding to their gender identity. The estimate may also help lawmakers and advocates across the country better understand the populations they serve. And here, there's a great quote from uh, Jody, and it, it, she said, uh, we want to make sure that policy debates are informed by the actual figures. And then finally, I'll just note one, uh, the Times went on to say, and forgive me for the patting on our backs, but it's a proud moment. The, the, the Times stated, the Williams Institute, well regarded for its research on LGBT issues, was frequently cited during the same-sex marriage debates for its findings on the positive uh, economic impact of allowing the practice. It also published a widely accepted estimate of the, of the national LGBT population six years ago. So what are some of the ways in which these data are impacting law and policy? Under the Obama administration, we saw the executive take a number of actions um, that were designed to protect the LGBT population and to promote inclusion of LGBT people in our society. And here I've just listed a few, some of the major ones, but there's many more. For example, uh, President Obama in 2013 issued an executive order that prohibits federal contractors, companies that contract with the federal government, from discriminating on, discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And at the same time, President Obama issued another executive order that added gender identity as a protected status for federal civilian employees. President Clinton had added sexual orientation back in the 90s, but gender identity was not in there until 2014. And when President Obama took these actions, he relied on research from the Williams Institute and others related to the discrimination that LGBT people face in employment and in other settings. Another place that we're seeing these data impact, or we saw impact uh, federal law and policy was uh, numerous regulations that came out of various federal agencies. And here I've just listed uh, two examples and I'm just going to speak about one. From the Department of Health and Human Services, um, put out a regulation in, uh, last year in 2016, uh, the final rule came out that uh, implements the non-discrimination provision of the Affordable Care Act. And that provision is Section 1557. And it does not prohibit on its face sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination, but it does prohibit sex discrimination. And so in developing the regulations under that statute, the uh, Health and Human Services look to this sort of data in order to, uh, one, interpret the sex discrimination provision to cover gender identity discrimination as well as certain forms of sexual orientation, but also to look at the various forms of discrimination that people, are, uh, trans people are facing in the healthcare setting, like not being able to access gender-related, uh, uh, transition-related care under their insurances, and the uh, HHS issued these extensive regulations related to that, and, and the data that um, uh, we heard about today informed uh, what HHS did. In addition, beyond uh, formal regulations, there was uh, a, a number of sub-regulatory guidances that came out from various agencies. And here I've just listed one, which is from OSHA, um, Occupational Safety uh, and Health Administration, which put out uh, best practices for uh, businesses to follow with respect to trans people and uh, bathroom access. And in those best practices, they specifically refer to um, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, which was the, uh, the survey done before the U.S. Trans Survey. And then finally, I just want to uh, mention the ways in which these data are impacting data collection at the federal level. Bianca very quickly went over the process and very kindly skipped over the methodology that, uh, and the methodological work that went into getting gender identity questions onto the California Health Interview Survey, but I want to spend a moment on that just to say the methodological advances that they made in that work, particularly because it was a population-based survey and not a convenience sample, convinced the federal government 
how to, in how to proceed in adding gender identity measures to the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is the largest and first federal population-based survey that includes a measure of gender identity. So the work that's been done on the local level and the state level is snowballing and impacting what's happening on the federal level. Holy moly, three minutes. Um, so it's not just federal policy, but it's also court decisions. And here I've just cited two court decisions that relied specifically on data from the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. This is Adkins versus City of New York, a very well-respected judge from the Southern District of New York, uh, Judge Rakoff relied on uh, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey when holding that a trans person had an protection claim uh, related to uh, his conditions of confinement. He was uh, arrested by the NYPD during the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests. He was first put in a male facility, and then when they found out he was trans, he was out of that male facility and uh, handcuffed to a wall and not provided food and then sued for equal protection violations. And Judge Rakoff, in allowing that, uh, that, uh, the equal protection claim to go forward, relied on the NTDS. Um, I'll skip over, actually, I don't want to skip over this one because it's uh, a, a great quote. But here's another decision related to the Affordable Care Act uh, 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 non-discrimination provision that I mentioned before. This case came out before those regulations uh, came out that I was mentioning before, but here, the defendants uh, tried to sort of sweep away the NTDS findings and say, these general findings about the transgender population aren't relevant to this particular plaintiff's experience. The court disagreed. The court said, well, of course these data don't tell us what happened to this particular person. They nonetheless are part of the context that trans people are, are living in this world and therefore increases the plausibility of this one particular plaintiff's claim. Uh, there's a number of pending cases across the country that we're expecting to see uh, these data uh, become relevant. Uh, there's the McCrory versus uh, uh, Berger case that deals with uh, North Carolina's HB2 uh, law. Barber versus uh, Bryant, this is uh, concerns Mississippi's law that elevates and insulates three particular religious beliefs for special protection under Mississippi law or anti-LGBT religious beliefs. Um, there's the Whitaker case that uh, was discussed earlier, and then finally the GG case that uh, we heard about earlier as well. And uh, we filed an uh, amicus briefs in all of, uh, all of these cases, um, and I don't have time to get into it now, but these were slides I hoped to show or to give some specific uh, citations that we've used uh, marshalling all of these social science, all of the social research, and all of these data to um, give the courts a fuller picture of who transgender people are and the types of discrimination they face. And it's those data, they inform not only the statutory construction of Title IX in the GG case, uh, but also the constitutional claims, as I mentioned before in, uh, when I was uh, mentioning the Adkins case. Um, and it's not just us, Williams, that's citing this work, but uh, uh, numerous of the amicus briefs cite these work. And here I'll just want to applaud Jody and, and Sandy to say, um, in the briefing to the Supreme Court in the GG case, about half of the briefs on, uh, in favor of uh, the transgender student cited Jody's work and uh, Sandy's work in the USTS. Um, and I think that's just just, it just evidences how impactful this work is. And then, just to end, it's not just people who support uh, trans people who are utilizing these data, but speaking to the integrity of the data and the reliability of the data, and we, that's most important, I think, to us, right? That this work is credible and, and can be cited by both sides. I just brought up one example of, of, of one amicus brief that filed against the transgender student. And here you can see that um, in the, where the arrow is, that they're citing the, uh, the, uh, the estimates on the number of trans um, uh, people in the country that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, panelists and audience, for hanging in there with us.
Um, we do need to end at 3.50 in order to give enough time for the court to get set up and to transition microphones. So I'm going to ask one question and just kind of ask the panelists to try to give a, a two to three answer after question. And after that one, too. Um, we'll, we'll see if we'll do that. Okay. Um, so can you tell me, um, so. that and that is yeah. awesome. We appreciate having you be part yeah. of this. Um, what do you think would be necessary to build upon the, some of the momentum here today? In just a few words, and we'll start with you. Um, more resources. <laughs> resources. Thank you, well, Bianca. Uh, I'll say the same. We can get to. Oh. Yeah, I that, but I would say um, I think um, having uh, more trans people, more gender nonconforming people, in, in, in involved in some of the research that's being done is really important. Um, we, we we really need uh, to have more more voices um, who are currently experiencing some of this to be part of the process, and I think it will really help to inform um, the kind of work we do going forward. Thank you, Sandy. Adam? I'll defer. Okay. And um, I've been, I was born this way. I was born with transsexualism, and I wanted to say thank you to Jody Herman for acknowledging that a lot of people didn't answer. And I also wanted to um, say thank you to Corinne Conran for admitting that it was in the 90s when the transgender ideology started being socially engineered. Um, but I'm actually transsexual. Um, but this is about misclassification. So just really quick, I just wanted to, um, to clarify that when you put trans and women together, it's a form of misgendering. It's othering us. And so I think that you should follow um, the other graphics I saw and separate them because we're women and we shouldn't, you know, have one characteristic trump all other characteristics. Um, so real quick, um, so misgendering is a form of transphobic gender segregation and it leads to violence and depression and marginalization. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, in the early 90s, Janice Ray Raymond, who was a lesbian academic, um, worked with the Reagan administration and the National Center for Health Technology to basically enroll the national coverage um, detention to strip trans people of Medicare and transition-related um, health care. And the reason why this is significant is in Austin, this started in 1989. And it was, and so in 1987, when homosexuality was taken out of the DSM, transsexuality was put in, and there's a lot of gay and lesbian um, psychiatrists who had access who helped facilitate that, and it was like a political bargaining chip, like we've been used as a political bargaining chip for many decades. And real quick, because I know um, the next session has to start, um, fast forward to today, um, we still do see LGB health academics and nonprofits um, and, how, and uh, though it may be less blatant, it's still othering. For example, MSM is basically men who sleep with, or males who sleep with males. And so in the HIV world, um, the gay men who run that industry, they classify trans women as males and men. And this is very um, hurtful, it's very inaccurate, it's very demeaning, and it, you know, we feel segregated. We feel that our womanhood has, is being slighted by our LGB allies time and time again. And so, um, and then they also like to say, oh, we're the same role as cross-dressers. A lot of cross-dressers are heterosexual men who don't identify as women. So it's very offensive to, to um, cause I thought we were talking about classification. Um, fast forward to today, there's a feminist named Chim, Chim um, Manda Adichie. She um, is from Africa, but she just um, went over here and did an interview and she said that trans women are not women. And so this is going back to Janice Raymond's time again, and no one has really stood up for us. So I guess in closing, um, I just wanted to remind you guys that like our womanhood is it's not a debate. It's not, you know, and I just, I just don't understand. There's a lot of gender nonconforming lesbian academics from the 70s to today that don't want to let us have our womanhood. They want to other us. And a lot, and I transitioned as a child. Um, I'm 37 now, but because of the, you know, the influx of, of media and, and education, a lot of trans girls are transitioning younger and younger and younger, and they're going to grow up and be like, why are you othering us? Why are you, you know, you know, so I just want you guys to consider that a lot of these mental health challenges you're talking about, a lot of it comes from misgendering, even from allies. So sometimes, you know, we just have to affirm who people are yeah. instead of othering them. No, thank you. And that's, I mean, it's much appreciated. I mean, I think 
was significant, and we can talk about this offline and, you know, we look at our work. You know, there are a lot of ways people can look at disparities related to mental health and how, what they, the reasoning behind them. And, you know, I think it's pretty clear that the frameworks that most of us are using rely on a social determinants framework, meaning we're interested and we understand that there's a role of oppression and culture in informing those disparities. So thank you. I know we have to move on to we, a lot of the people that were being Ashley, sexualized yeah, and thank objectified. You. By thank you for being here and speaking up. And it's really, it's through the voice of, of um, dissent that we have gotten where we are. And so it's critical perspectives are always welcome. Um, uh, we would love to talk with you as soon as we wrap up. Absolutely. All right, thank you to our panelists, thank you to the audience, and we look forward to having you rejoin us at four from the court.